Well, that took way too long, but hopefully the next season is easier. Uh-oh. Don't tell me. It's 32 episodes and much longer. Yep. Another Goku vs. Superman? Most likely. Bring it on. Never ask me for anything ever again! <laughs> Welcome back to every episode of Death Battle reviewed in 10 words or less. Last time we covered a season that, while it doesn't technically hold up all that much, was still a blast to talk about, going down memory lane and even being pleasantly surprised by episodes that still hold up. Most of all though, we got to see this slow burn in the show evolving, right up until the very end where that burn erupted to a hydrogen blast. But here's the tricky thing, what exactly was the show supposed to do now? After all, the original episode list had Goku vs Superman as the series finale. Yeah, sort of. We'll get to you, you little weirdo. And the episode itself certainly had a showstopper tone. But after some reevaluation about the show's staying power, not to mention a fuck ton of views, Death Battle defied its own death sentence and came back with a vengeance. At the time, getting 32 more episodes of my favorite internet show was thrilling. Looking back on it as a college dropout who's been paid by some blondie to talk about every episode of the show in a seasonal format. <laughs> So for the sake of sanity, I'm keeping this intro relatively short considering everything we have to go through, as well as the elephant in the room. Or should I say elephant man in the room? Show yourself! Yahoo! And here I thought I'd be able to pull the dead wool over your eyes. Truth be told, I was hoping to get the drop on you this video, but clearly I should have accounted for Raccoon Bro's inconsistent upload schedule. Ugh, I feel like I should be more surprised by something like this. But this really is such a you thing to do, isn't it? Also, it explains this very specific detail in my contract. Alrighty, let's see here. Any and all interruptions, no matter the amount of walls, will not be an excuse to halt your review duties. Jeez, and I thought Iger was cutthroat. But enough about that. Let's annoy you! Ahem. In this side of the couch, the mark with the mouth, the regenerating degenerate, Canada's number one heartthrob, Wade Winston Wilson! AKA a Deadpool. Look, man, I don't have time. Huh? Wade Winston Wilson? If you make a single Overwatch reference, I will end you. Whatever. Look, man, I'm trying to run a review here. This video is already set to be longer than the wait for your new movie. So why don't you make like a tree and fuck off? Who's I see. Well, you are right about at least one thing, Nate. The wait between movies can be dull. So I figured what better way to pass the time than to sit in on someone singing my past praises. A trip down memory lane is just what the doctor ordered. I'd prefer a restraining order. Well, it's not like I can kick you out. And exploiting you for views doesn't sound too bad. Plus, your episode's in the middle of the season, so it's not like you'll be here for too long right? Buddy, depending on what you say for my episode, I'd be more worried about whether you'll be here for much longer. That might be more difficult than you think, since Raccoon Bro also has a life clause in that contract. You have to work with him forever? No, I mean a literal life clause. He owns my soul until my work for him is finished. And you signed that willingly? It was either that or go into customer service. Oh, well in that case, I totally get it. Wait, what the hell were we talking about? The ambiguously gay duo. The ambiguously gay duo. E Man versus Liono. For such a fun episode concept, there was a lot riding on this one. Now that we've seen the heights this show could reach, all eyes were on the season 2 premiere, cause how the hell do you follow up the apocalypse? Eventually, after nearly 5 months, that's 141 days, bitches. We would be answered not with a bang, but more like a confetti cannon. It was smart of the team to not try to immediately outdo themselves in scope. Cause how could you? Instead we get a near opposite in tone fight that showed how much fun this show can still be even on a smaller scale. The research process of this episode is no secret, and one of Ben and Chad's favorite stories of yore to recount. With how ridiculous those 80s cartoons are, they spent most of the time one-upping each other and how crazy their respective characters' feats got. My guy survived the center of the earth. Well, my guy can cause whirlwinds by running fast enough. My guy was in the vacuum of space once. Well, my guy magicked a chain back together. They waste no no time in admitting how stupid these cartoons were, even down to the questionable toy designs themselves. I highly doubt this will offend many fans though. Cause for one, cartoons from that time rarely hold up, and Wiz and Boomstick feel like people who did enjoy those shows when they were younger, yet are able to admit that, yeah, our main references for masculinity back then were a Chippendale and a furry. The Goku vs Superman reference felt natural given they both fought Superman. Plus, come on. 
How could they not? And while the abundance of clips used could have been toned down, it does help get you into the mindset of this fight's tone. Mr. Lang returns, and it's every bit as goofy as I could have hoped for. Much like Vegeta vs. Shadow, the main draw for this animation is the dialogue, which doubles down on the camp in a way fitting to the fighters. These two banter each other to death just as much as Brawl, and the cheesy puns and accidental innuendos are glorious. Want to keep going? Looks like you're a bit tied up at the moment. Sorry, Catman, but you won't string me along that easily. You would mount that poor pussy like some sort of mule, you muscular fiend! Even the plot itself leans in on the ridiculousness. lion -O can control all cats, which is a reasonable counter to Battle Cat. So He-Man's solution is to pound the damn pussy into the stratosphere. I don't know what's more crazy, him doing that at all, or the fact that it worked! Edwin Tiong and Xander Mobus had way too much fun with this script and captured the boomy, righteous tones of the original actors very well, as if these two voice acted in the 80s themselves. A whirlwind should blow him off course. I think I've got a fireball! My favorite delivery would still have to be He-Man's response to the Sword of Omens. You are clearly not equipped to... Oh. Metaton would be proud. The fighting isn't too intricate, those fast-paced combos come into play every now and then, but it's mostly about showing off Lino's tricky artillery and He-Man's absurd strength, both of which are at their most effective for the mountain toss. I'd argue this was the most important and influential bit of the whole episode. It's proof that the scope of a fight can still be jaw-dropping even without going planetary, and I love how the tone becomes serious for this moment to get the weight across, only for it to shift back into the goofy as He-Man comes a-running along accompanied by his theme music, which has to punctuate nearly all of his actions here. The scabbard being so inconsistent did linger in the back of my mind, and there were other weird bits that felt less like intentional camp and just off. Like how Lino blasts He-Man away and is immediately like, way to go. Maybe have him instead say, whoops, perhaps I put a little too much juice into that last one, and then go into the sight beyond sight spiel. But the ending is particularly weird. Not just the death, which, holy cow, what incredible build-up, music, tension, and then it's done. Or how the analysis opens as if Lino was the winner. Don't try to hide it. I already saw it. They then establish how strong He-Man is. Okay, so far so good. But then they say how much stronger he is than the strongest weightlifter in real life? But how much stronger is he than Lion? Okay, I guess it's over. But even then, it's hard to be mad when it ends with that amazing PSA gag. Arr, I miss my balls! Fun fact, Chad voiced this part, whereas Cringer was voiced by Lang himself. And on the topic of voice acting, this was our first episode with Chris Guerrero as the announcer. A very welcome addition to the Death Battle family. Man, this episode's just pure fun. Even the oddities I brought up managed to enhance the tone they were going for. The imperfection is what makes it perfect. You could tell Ben and Chad needed a stress relief to open up the new season, and going back to a simpler time with two icons of cheesy 80s action was the way to go. That the only move you know, mate. Shao Kahn vs. M. Bison. Continuing the inexplicable saga of Street Fighter vs. Mortal Kombat, this one ain't too bad. Analysis sections feel a little like they've taken a step back, at least in terms of story coverage. It didn't bother me as much last time, since at least the lines both He-Man and Lion-O's analyses ended on paralleled each other and fit the silly tone. Here we get a pretty decent coverage of their stories, but then they just end abruptly. Fortunately, the chosen clips carry a lot of the slack in that department. Especially the Tuesday monologue, the team knew what they were doing including that one, though I'm honestly partial to Bison's other one. I killed my father too, and you don't hear me whining about it. Can I get a based in the chat? Don't worry, Papino, that wasn't directed towards you. I also can appreciate a majority of the jokes. If we ever get a Captain Planet episode, I insist that they throw an M. Bison cameo in there somewhere, and I don't care whether or not it fits. And the Annihilation jab served as a neat way to establish what was being considered canon, while also dunking on a shit video game adaptation. A daily reminder Mortal Kombat fans are all too familiar with. The battle's fine, if a tad slow paced. This moment of Khan busting out of the mind control has neat audio effects. I like the Psycho Crusher combo here, but any of the others are pretty lacking. A big theme of this episode is that they're the final bosses of fighting games infamous for their cheap moves. Obviously, it was their intention to translate this into the fight, but that doesn't exactly make for the most compelling choreography, does it? It doesn't help that Khan has zero voice clips of pained grunts, so it ends up feeling like he no-sells all the hits, which I guess is a prerequisite for any fight starring him. It even says flawless victory, so if anything, that just proves my point further. While Bison has cool moments of energy blasts and theatrics, 
Khan is the dominant force here. I love how he didn't even have to try. Those projectiles just went rocketing right back to sender. It's so freaking chaotic. I'm gonna hit you with so many right hooks, you'll be begging for a left. Even Final Bison does jack all despite the great introduction and music sting, getting subdued by more spamming, and a hammer beat down that is hard carried by the accompanying musical notes. I just think it sounds cool. That's gotta be up there as one of the worst transformations on the show. And there's some pretty steep competition coming up. The death and results are plenty serviceable, even if the soul calculation felt a bit like padding. We get a different variation of the KO announcement from last time, with this one being the true version we're all accustomed to. <laughs> KO! <laughs> KO! And the extended Captain Bison song was a major treat to cap things off. The action of this episode is similar in quality to the last fight without the cheesy dialogue to help it stand out. But I still like this one a lot. The standard episodes of season 2 are a massive leap forward compared to season 1's. Kind of baffling that we get all the possible matchups we could out of these four characters except for the one that actually makes thematic sense. Even the fight for third place could still be interesting. Ryu Hayabusa vs Strider Hiryu Up to this point, I was starting to feel pretty proud of myself for feeling more cultured, being able to at the very least recognize most of the show's opponents after Peach vs Zelda. But then came in this episode to quickly humble my uppity 10-year-old self. My family didn't get NES games, how should I know? And in case it wasn't obvious, the streak of confusion didn't stop there. Analysis sections aren't too shabby. At this point, I think I have to accept the segments ending right after listing the big feats is just gonna be the style for a hot minute. Using the assassin assassination clip to lead into the badass stuff Ryu has done was very effective. I even liked the Yoshi vs Riptor callback surprisingly. The best thing to come out of that episode, clearly. The focus was more about hyping up their huge arsenals, which works better here than in something like Kratos vs Spawn because most of what they discuss actually shows up in the fight. The fast-paced dueling is exactly what I've been waiting for, as it's Lang's true bread and butter, making this feel the most like one of his earlier fights out of any of his season 2 episodes. It's an action-packed battle of magic vs technology to see who falters first from attrition. I love how for all the wacky gadgets and abilities that are put on display, ultimately everything gets countered perfectly by our fighter's main weapons. Which is what the verdict comes down to. I'm with Boomstick, that little ch 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 ch, -ch sound is super satisfying. If a little weird for a ninja to be wielding, I love the elevator shaft scuffle and how their shadows outpace them. And once they've been stripped down to the bare essentials, it all comes down to one final stroke. Reminiscent of the Ninja Gaiden intro. Were people really surprised that Ryu lost? Doesn't everyone know that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree? Like father, like son, as they say. Tact, Deadpool. Eh, who gives a crap? They're both dead. And what a death at that. It was suspenseful enough, but even though the victor was already clear, Strider wasn't taking any chances and used that opening for a devastating finisher that fittingly bookends the fight by taking them all the way back to the starting point. Like Nin Poetry. And in case that felt more like a knockout to you, take this bird bomb shit for good measure. This battle does the only one character gets to have voice clips thing again, making it hard to read Ryu. Which I guess could be considered a good thing since he's a ninja, but I should at least be able to tell when he gets hurt. At least Khan was able to say stuff. Still a neat episode that gets the job done in the ninjas doing every cool thing except actual ninja shiz department. And yes, that is faithful to both series. Ah, video games. Now if only I could get my money back from this Lumosity deal that feels like a scheme the Eds would have cooked up. Especially this stupid train mini game! Damn it! I saw boobies. What more can a man ask for? Ivy Valentine vs Black Orchid. Here we have the final installment of the Horny Boomstick arc, uh, kind of. While we would certainly get remnants of it later that definitely hinder their respective episodes, things never get quite as eyebrow raising as this one from here on out. With the exceptions being in a different category of problematic, I was bracing myself for the cringe, but it honestly wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I mean, Ivy's got the whole dominatrix thing going, so it's kinda inevitable. Boomstick's idea about Ivy's aging going straight to her boobs doesn't feel all that outlandish compared to game theory. And given Orchid literally weaponizes her body for a no mercy, I feel like you kinda have to talk about it? Not sure if I'd dedicate a fourth of the verdict to the topic. The only other notable thing about the analysis is that while it serves as the emotional climax to the horny Boomstick arc, it also inadvertently creates the Boomstick's dad arc. When that is your episode's legacy, that's how you know something isn't right. Zombie pirates don't make good fathers. Believe me, I know. Funny thing is, that almost lines up with Sarge in a roundabout way. Surely good day, Mr. Caboose. We be having a prisoner for you, we do. I thought you had a pirate accent. Arr, I'm not very consistent. Arr.
Really, the only memorable element is the sex jokes. And by now, those just go in one ear and out the other. So instead of discomfort, these analyses make me feel bored. I'd like to join Ivy's feet if you know what I'm saying. What? Same goes for the fight, which takes place on a blank slate of a battlefield and is just combo practice. It's well animated, and the final beatdown in particular has a bunch of energy behind it. I like how this final breath moment is a reference to how you can button mash out of the defeat state for a final push in the games. But overall, the fight doesn't even crack 90 seconds and doesn't have the spectacle to make up for like the best one minute melees. Kinda like that other episode starring two female fighting game characters. It's a friggin' crime that this is Mr. Lang's last outing on the show. The man was a massive asset in helping Death Battle evolve and it sucks that the most memorable thing about his final episode was two sprite models flashing each other. And a sibling. It's a season 1 episode disguising itself as a season 2 outing, leaving it in this weird limbo state of not really belonging anywhere. Did you know that this episode serves as Ivy's voice actor Lonnie Manella's main source of information on the character? And no, I'm not making that up. You mean, the, you mean they're furries? I mean, they're furry peg legs. <laughs> they're peg leg furries. No, in in spaceships. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> People have the weirdest imagination. Fox McCloud versus Bucky O'Hare. At least this time I didn't have to feel as bad about not knowing a combatant. I'm pretty sure most people know Bucky exclusively through this video. I forgot how incredible Fox's analysis is. Even by today's standards, it still holds up. Sort of. They clarified that the barrel roll is actually an aileron roll, yet in the same video, they also perpetuated and possibly popularized the metal legs myth. Also, hello, Smash Brothers. Long time no see. But they cover his whole story, have a good balance of quips, and the music choice was immaculate. My favorite moment is towards the beginning when they start to set up Andros. The pause and dramatic tone are great at grabbing your attention and making you feel uneasy, like this dark, insurmountable force is on its way to snuff out the light of the universe. And the ending actually feels like an ending by saying how he took up his father's mantle and started a new generation of Star Fox. Bucky's analysis was a mess. I get that he's one of the most niche characters to be used on the show to this day, but they spent way too much time being like, okay, I know this guy is obscure, but trust me, he's really cool and not just here because we needed an obligatory Fox matchup. The comedy is more in your face. They show the weakness section while talking about his strengths and play 37 seconds of the show's theme song. And no, they don't actually play the entire theme, but it's still more than half. It's a cartoon theme song from the 80s, so of course it kicks ass, but it shouldn't be used to to introduce a character you already know most people haven't heard of. That's your job, guys! The opening can be put into the same category as Goku vs. Superman's bridge skit, but this is so much worse. It's slow, visually unappealing, and much like Peach, Slippy was another character that gamers were way too obsessed with hating on at the time. Bucky and his crew fight Toads, to be fair, so it'd be weird if this wasn't at least mentioned, but Slippy makes no attempt to get out of the way, and his friends don't even bother doing anything until after Slippy dies. And Fox even takes his damn legs in the aftermath. You know, this reminds me of this one trigger-happy space raccoon I met way back whenever. Wonder how his vacation in space Hawaii is going. You just skip to the fight part, because this is honestly some pretty solid stuff. It's Molly Delizer's debut, who we'll be seeing plenty more of this season for good reason. This is basically just Smash Fox, but it's a well-animated Smash Fox, and his wombo combos are major highlights. We do get a lot of shooting, yet somehow missing, even when the target is motionless moments, even when Bucky is plummeting straight down. Though this is Smash Fox, so I wouldn't be surprised if the implication is that he is hitting Bucky, but it just doesn't make him flinch. That bunny stomp is about the best thing I could say about Bucky here. Because it's basically the Fox McCloud show. He gets the most stylish moments, most of the dramatic beats are focused on him, and the only voice clip Bucky gets is when he's getting choked to death. Speaking of which, the climax hard carries this episode's score. It may be an old wives' tale, but I love how when Fox loses his metal legs, his headstrong attitude directs him to use whatever scraps he has left to charge in and catch the inexperienced Bucky off guard before a death that has no reason to be as brutal as it is. And yet it's so friggin' badass, I can't help but love it. This episode is so weird for me to rank. The analysis is halfway great, and even though the fight is 2 minutes and 41 seconds, nearly a minute of that is spent in the drab space setting before we actually get to the fight on Random Ass Planet. This could be due to the new animator transition as well as the lack of confidence in using a character as obscure as Bucky, but I'd say the good outweighs the bad. But now that we've covered every 2013 episode, I know, right? I know what you're all thinking. Was Cole vs. Alex faithful to this era of the show? Not really. Fuck!
Even in the future, nothing works. Terminator vs. Robocop. I'd say it's fitting that we got this episode after Bucky's bad guys were compared to Skynet, but most of us had long forgotten that episode by this point since it took nearly four months for it to come out. At least the wait between Goku vs. Superman and He-Man vs. Lino made sense. I was so sure as a kid that the show had died. Anytime someone says Death Battle should go back to the release when ready mentality, I'll direct them to this torturous wait period. Luckily, it was more than worth it. It's our first episode featuring movie characters, which happens way less often than you'd assume. Since since they're film characters with clear and digestible stories, uh, sort of, this is time travel. It helps these analysis sections feel more properly structured than any before. These clips are great at familiarizing us with their iconic one-liners and even following up on the host's banter. Like here, it feels as if Arnie is saying that to Wiz himself for calling him sloppily designed. Hearing the sound of each of the weapons being fired was a neat touch, the montage of Robocop's crime stopping was hype, and the transition from his weaknesses right into why we love him was so damn good. Like, yeah, he's technically human, but even with a cold, he's still a badass. Speaking of badasses, we've made it to the debut episode of one of Death Battle's Hall of Famers. You know him, you love him, the Chancellor of Flips! Torian Crawford has entered the fray as the show's go-to 3D animator. I'm really glad they gave him a movie episode like this to start with, giving us a great first impression of his talents. The longer runtime feels natural to the characters and makes great use of their arsenals and wits. 7 minutes and 36 seconds, almost as long as Goku vs Superman's without the abridged skit. The setup is great. Great. It's essentially the start of another Terminator film if Arnie was unlucky enough to land in Detroit. Horrifying. Holy shit! And yes, that gun shop owner is Curtis Arnott. Unironically, his best performance on the show... Go on... So far? I've got my eye on you, JPEG. PNG. Whatever. <sighs> yeah, the voice actors are all great. Joe Goddard does a great impression of Arnie and captures the emotionless hunter persona frighteningly. I don't even mind the lack of grunts, because unlike other characters on the show, it actually fits this time and helps differentiate the two, making Murphy feel more humanized. Hasta la vista, baby. Good news, scum. You are no longer under arrest. And here he gets humanized by Xander Mobus, returning as another 80s action hero. And while he's obviously more monotone this time, the one-liners are still just as effective. The sounds of the different guns are all fantastic. This little shotgun scuffle at the beginning serves as a peek through the window of Torian's hand-to-hand -hand imagination, using but a mere fraction of his power. I like how Arnie dominates on the ground because of Murphy's slower speed, but once the wackier gadgets are brought out, Murphy gets the upper hand thanks to his more creative thinking. The display HUDs serve as neat foreshadowing to the climax, Arnie gets way more terrifying as the skin melts off, and they do a great job making the plasma rifle feel far more dangerous than anything else. Up to this point, Murphy had mostly been tanking the bullets, cause, you know, he's freaking Robocop. He can take $200 custom tooled cartridges at 10,000 rounds per minute and just go owie! But the moment this thing was whipped out, his best course of action was to take cover for the first time and disarm it, letting himself tank the rest to set Arnie up for his own most powerful weapon. But even after all that, Arnie's still trying to kill the dude! That's what I love most about Long run times. It makes monsters like the Terminator way more terrifying because of how seemingly impossible they are to put down for good. Fortunately, Chekhov's gun comes to the rescue and Murphy is able to keep his city from being destroyed. Uh-huh. Just wait until the next 3D episode. It's Torian's first outing, so of course it's got its hiccups. That Robocop lip sync gives me Andromeda vibes, and it's a little unfair to say Murphy survived a hydraulic press by pushing it when Arnie didn't even have all his limbs at the time. But hardware limitations hardly detract from the coolness factor and epic one-liners. I can't believe movie characters haven't been more normalized on the show. No way, I can totally believe it. Best episode so far, and it's not even a question. We're number two! Luigi vs. Tails. That's right, I used a clip from the Emoji Movie, cause that's the level of respect this episode deserves. Hot damn, I forgot how bad it is. What is it with every Mario character getting major disrespect up to this point other than Mario himself? In the last Mario episode, they called Peach a useless damsel who should quit being a tease. Here they call Luigi a slave. Not paraphrasing, by the way. I had to do a double take during my rewatch because I only ever hear folks talk about that other slave line this season. I assumed it'd just be the one! But yeah, there's no way Luigi would want to help his brother without getting as much of the glory just because he's a good, genuine person, 
or something. Obviously, his brother has to have major dirt on him. Who cares if Luigi defeated Dementio, who's basically this universe's equivalent of the devil? He struggled to lift a radish that one time in a game that was also a dream. Bro can't even lift. Even as a kid, I was screaming at this one part where they said the poltergeist can kill ghosts. Newsflash, that's not how it works. Tails' analysis is better for the simple fact that they actually hype him up, but they also call him a stalker, which, I don't know, if the second movie had come out by then, they might have had a point. And the end of it straight up sucks. They close with a steroids joke and a clip that's way too long from a game that arguably portrays one of the worst versions of Tails. And fittingly, this animation portrays one of the worst versions of Luigi. This is Eric Mart's first and last animation on the show, which is unfortunate because they certainly have talent and a good grip on how to make sprites work in a 3D environment. But the battle script they had to work with just wasn't it, man. I can respect the idea of giving them exclusive power-ups to help differentiate it from Mario vs. Sonic, even though Luigi still gets his hammer, what? And while it starts slow, there's a decent bit of back and forth at the beginning, but once Tails takes Luigi into the air, it goes down Eyeballs Hill. Tails is still somehow grabbing Luigi even though the vanished flower is supposed to make you intangible, and for a kid with a 300 IQ, it takes him way too long to figure out what's going on here. The following scuffle is alright, but once again, Luigi gets no meaningful hits in, and that includes this part where his utilization of the poltergust is rendered completely moot. What was that about Tails getting tired after spending too much time airborne? Luigi remembers his name is also in the title and finally gets to do something with the lightning beat down. Even though Tails doesn't act scared at all despite the analysis establishing his astrophobia, and after that, he gets zilch! Jack all! Assolutamente niente! Zippo! All the negative zone does is make Tails trip. Which even if Luigi was taken seriously up to this point, that'd still be a major missed opportunity. Barring the personal attachment I have to the Mario series and Luigi as a character, the fight is just underwhelming. None of the hits have impact, and there are too many pull the rug out from under you moments. Like how the ending tricks you into thinking a big final showdown is coming with the music change, and then Luigi dies. He was given the respect of a Koopa beforehand, was ragged all throughout, and the fight ended on his echoing crying. You can have the fighters be scaredy cats while still giving them cool moments to shine. Man, even Starscream was treated better than this. Vegeta! Look! A Pokemon! Vegeta versus Mewtwo. While they obviously would never do something like this today, here's an episode that- Wait, hang on, you're not really gonna talk about this one, are you? Okay, you got me. Yeah! Pokemon. Battle Royale, our first episode to make the jump to 1080p, I'm honestly kind of surprised they've yet to do any kind of spiritual successor to this one. But at the same time, I don't mind since it helps this episode feel all the more special. And while same series matchups usually draw ire, this one feels justified as it's always been a schoolyard debate for a super long time and wouldn't happen normally in canon. As for my stance, anytime my classmates got a bit too wily over it, I would just hide in my Eevee is the best bunker and wait it out. The analysis is a major improvement over the last Battle Royale. It helps that there's not as much personality and history to tackle, and having one less opponent keeps it from feeling cluttered. Other than the one sleep powder roofy comment, like wow that shit caught me off guard. These segments are great at covering the strengths, weaknesses, fighting styles, and the symmetry in starting off with their evolution lines, having a real world calc, and ending with the Pokedex entries is very satisfying for my autistic brain. I know I don't need to mention it, but I'm still gonna. Boomsticks, turtles, and tanks theory still cracks me up as one of the best jokes of the show. And it makes real watches of My Little Pony a tad awkward in hindsight. He's like a tank. This fight has a hilarious setup, implying the death battle team has this kind of technology to mess with the natural order. And it falls in line with their philosophy of no player influence. Another element that feels more justified when compared to Link vs. Cloud, since it's not nearly as limiting and is pretty much necessary. Molly killed it with some awesome effects on the moves, and the choreography never felt confusing despite the additional fighter. While Venusaur had a brutal death, he at least got some awesome status effect moments and the crazy beam struggle. Boomstick may not care that much, but the bias does fall in line with this episode's playground debate tone. Like, Venusaur has his fans, sure, but it's silly to pretend that's not an unpopular opinion. I knew one kid that preferred Venusaur back in kindergarten. We don't talk to that kid anymore. Stop! What the hell? Sorry, blame the voices. They told me to. If he disrespects my baby boy ever again, shoot between his eyes! The bout with Charizard and Blastoise has an awesome intro reminiscent of Wild Battles. The animalistic raw as hell clashing is sick and makes sense given they're not being directed by trainers, acting off pure wild animal instinct to survive. And in case you're one of the peeps sad that they didn't have the budget to pull off the original Batman vs. Spider-Man ending, well, they have the budget now. So over the top, it's glorious.
glorious. And while the ending feels like a season 1 verdict at first, it ultimately comes down to math, making this one of the few death battles where they actually did end the debate once and for all. And the whole Blastoise having better defense thing is strikingly close to Terminal Montage and Loxton's reasoning for their own Royale video. And it's already a tank! They even did an extended take on this concept recently. Go check it out. Charizard can never catch a break in these things, huh? Some of the sound design could be a little overbearing, and the actual fight choreography isn't exactly my cup of tea. But this episode still delivered on some Pokemon magnificent carnage. Eevee is still the best, though. Also, stick around for the credits if you'd like to be serenaded by Boomstick once again, with Wiz as backup. This show could be so endearing, man. Like and subscribe to Death Battle, like you just did. I run dead with did. It's not my best work. Robot, oh my gosh! Fulgore versus Sector. Before we get into this one, it's worth noting that this was originally supposed to come out after our next entry, but since that episode needed more time in the oven, this one had to be rushed out to fill in the slot, and the Death Battle crew did another poll to decide the opponent, this time within the research team exclusively. But despite everyone wanting Fulgore to fight Cyrax, they went with Sector instead, even though Cyrax and, hell, even Sub-Zero have far more connections. Yeah, I'm sure you all can see where this is going. The analyses aren't bad. Fulgore serves as a much better introduction to the Killer Instinct lore than the other two episodes, this lady cannot catch a break, and this was the start of the evil Walmart running gag. I also like the jokes on both sides of Boomstick being baffled by all the impossible shit stored inside these two. It's a very funny analysis, but that fight animation is even more hilarious. And not for the right reasons. No offense to Jawan Hobbs, but this fight felt like watching a jackrabbit high on lean trying to get the high score in DDR. It's impossible to keep up with, which is impressive for a fight where one of the characters stands still to charge up for most of the time. Why is Sector running around this warehouse? Why was Fulgore standing there motionlessly? What happened to his arm here? Things come at you a mile a second, and despite the short length, it's stuffed with so much goofy shit, like Sector's pulse blades having really loud lightsaber sound effects, and also jumping up to swing on these light fixtures. Because I guess they forgot to make a visual of Sector doing ninja shiz and included it last second. Fulgore holding up the compactor is honestly not a bad moment, but then it's followed up by a really lame ultra combo. Combo, which, by the way, was 26 hits, not 37. I counted. Told you guys I'm autistic. At least Black Orchid had a pretty hype ultra combo that used more than three moves. This fight was very close. Gives one character better agility and literally everything else to the other. Most of the enjoyment I get out of this episode may be ironic, but it's enjoyment nonetheless. And at least the analysis segments were decent. I'm pretty lax on this one overall, given the circumstances surrounding its production. And the short runtime makes it easy to sit through. Also, this was the first episode to have only one of its opponent's teeth. A trend that sucked and thankfully died gruesomely. Run! It's Godzilla! It looks like Godzilla, but due to international copyright laws, it's not. Still, we should run like it is Godzilla! Though it isn't. Godzilla vs. Gamera. Considering this is the episode that had to be delayed, that's even more reason for me to not give Fulgore vs. Sector too much crap, cause this one is a beast. Love both of the analysis segments a lot. As someone who's never gotten into kaiju movies, it was a really nice streamlined introduction to both series. I love how they handle the tonal whiplash in Godzilla's due to the number of incarnations with wildly different genres he has. Also, the end to Gamera's is really damn funny, not for the song, but for Wiz clarifying that Gamera does in fact not diddle kids, and risks his life to save them. To which Boomstick simply replies, That's pretty cool. Although, if you're hungry for more, definitely check out this SGC panel where Ben and Chad had to perform the analysis live since the full video got annihilated. I wonder how that could have happened. Okay, if you're trying to accuse me of breaking into the Screw Attack HQ, demanding an episode be made about me, getting rejected, and then pouring coffee over all their hard drives until they finally relented, then you must not have had as much respect for me as I assume. No, I guess not. Thanks for archiving, Riz. You live up to your name, my guy. While kaiju fights have never really been my thing, I have a great deal of respect for this one. Going with the more destructive version of Godzilla makes his fight with Gamera, Earth's protector, feel more natural. It may not be the kind of choreography we all remember him for, but before Torian got to more humanoid characters, he was able to show his great understanding of how to make two fighters feel like hulking building-sized powerhouses. Every step feels like an earthquake. Every roar is deafening. Every swipe and blast has 
just the right amount of anticipation and delivery to get across the power in a way that no other death battle up to this point is tackled. Goku and Superman felt powerful because of their lightning quick combos leaving shockwave after shockwave. Here, everything feels slower, yet much heavier. Cause once you're at that size, walking forward is enough to count as an attack. It was awesome seeing Godzilla's ridiculous moves get adapted. And these confused head tilts are way funnier to me than I think they were supposed to be. He's more of a savage behemoth, whereas Gamera comes off as more of a strategist behemoth. So I'm not sure why in the space scene he didn't just leave Godzilla up there. Like, obviously that's not as exciting as the planetary pile driver interrupted by Godzilla's lightning powers, but even though the verdict was very detailed, I kinda wish this was something they had addressed as a potential Gamera win con, and why it wouldn't be reliable enough. But that's balderdash in the long run. Once we get to the ocean section, everything gets way more intense as limbs are lost and beams are charged. I love how Godzilla doesn't have time to charge his beam since he's slower, but wins anyway through sheer durability and terror presence. The moment the ocean started getting displaced as the music cut out, I was starting to get a sinking feeling as well. And as Godzilla's unadulterated rage leads him to tower over his opponent and let out a final blast that not only obliterates Gamera, but does so by piercing the toughest part of his shell, I started to reconsider my life and why my parents never introduced me to kaiju entertainment if moments like these are what I'm in for. I mean, the closest they got was showing me that one film with Matthew Broderick and... Oh. That's why I skipped out on kaiju films, huh? I can't quite give this a 10 for personal reasons, but I can still acknowledge everything this episode gets right and why it means so much to fans of the giant monster genre. I thought you were dead. My death was greatly exaggerated. Batman vs. Captain America. I don't use this word lightly. It's a naughty word, after all, that can offend many. But out of all the episodes this season, Batman vs. Captain America feels the most like a filler episode. At the time, when Batman was announced to be returning, that low-key blew my Bambino mind. You're telling me combatants can return? Dig Dug vs. Dopey, let's go! This is also Nick Kramer's first episode to write and direct, and they gave him one with a returning combatant to help ease him into the process. That's when you realize Batman wasn't brought back because it'd be cool. He was made to be training wheels. Even Boomstick sounds bored out of his mind. Batman. Best part of Bruce's segment was this clip. Someone should give that guy a raise. He's far smarter than your average thug. I'll admit Captain America's analysis is all right. The drugs bit is funny, and I forgot how long it is, too. That was a pleasant surprise. I mean, you gotta give the guy who kicked old Jolly Green Giant in his pee pod some due credit. The battle itself is, uh, uh, a floor? Bland? What the third guy said. It's certainly well animated given it's Zach Watkins' debut, who has gone on to be an invaluable asset to the team. But not only is this a short fight, it feels short. It's kinda interesting having the tables turned on Batman, since Steve is more serious than Peter, so it's Bruce who gets ragdolled for most of the fight this time. But unlike Peter, who has a really cool gotcha moment of finally taking things seriously, Bruce's gotcha only happens because Steve, and all his superhuman fast-seeing wisdom, threw his shield into the smokescreen just hoping hoping it'd do something. To his credit, it did do something. And then totally not a superhuman, Mr. Wayne uppercuts Steve above the buildings, what? And hangs him with his magic sentient grappling hook. The fuck? This battle went from being the tamest white noise ever straight into Tom Fuckery territory, giving this episode tons of ironic value. I don't care how fast you can see, nobody saw this insane death coming. Even Peter would blush. That's about the only memorable part of this one, aside from starting the everything is better than titanium running gag. I'm thankful it gave us Zack, but Bruce really didn't need to return so soon, which is especially evident if you've just reviewed his last episode. And Steve deserves better. More than enough time has passed by now to justify a run back, and it's not like we're getting any more of him in the mid-CU, so there's really no reason to wait any longer. Once again, I continue to be the best part of everything I'm involved with. Debatable. LOUD NOISES! Tiger Zord vs. Gundam Epion. Ah yes, the episode that felt the most alienating to 11-year-old me, but today is still pretty alienating. When I said no kaiju for me, that included no giant robots either. And I'm not sure if these were the best characters to go with for introducing Power Rangers and Gundam to the show. But Tommy's analysis is a lot of fun. There's so many funny bits talking about the ridiculous nature of the franchise and it almost makes me wish I grew up on Power Rangers instead of Pokemon. 
Almost. What's important, though, is that I was able to follow his analysis fairly well, but on the other hand, Epion still confuses me. Zex doesn't even get name dropped until 40 seconds in. I'm sure it was meant to be in service to the story, but overall, it feels like a lot of shit was missing. They at least get the awesome power of the Gundam across, but to put things into perspective, Tommy's analysis ends with Boomstick calling the Tiger Zord an ass kicking Mighty Morphin Flame Sword and Power Kitty. Zex is congratulated for getting laid. I have a very mixed opinion on the fight. I'm fully aware it's beloved by many, but there's a lot of personal ticks that keep me from enjoying the cheesy fun as much as He-Man vs. Lion-O. For starters, the dialogue. A lot of it is still pretty funny, but not in the same way as our season premiere. That episode had a couple self-aware moments, but for the most part it felt close to a real crossover. I haven't seen either show, but something tells me lines like, oh, I'm just brooding, or this defies all logic, wouldn't actually appear in their respective series. Obviously, these characters interactions can't be 100% accurate to the source material. Half of the things that appear on Death Battle don't even use the word death, but it should at least feel like a proper homage. This was just a little off-putting to me. Most of Tommy's one-liners felt natural, though. He and Saba have amazing chemistry, and their banter together is easily my favorite part. It helps that the voice performances are some of the best I've heard up to now. Major props to Chris Niosi and Doug Drury on that front. The energy they bring is infectious and feels right at home with the Power Rangers. Eventually. <laughs> I think I'll drive. Is it just me, or do Zed's goons keep getting smaller and angrier? He's quick for a little guy. Stop messing around and start defending! Right. Hi -ya! Hi -ya! What? He didn't explode? Well, this defies all logic. On the other hand, you've got Stuart Shalomic as Zex. Much like with Zach Wilson, this is their one IMDb credit. Except here I can kinda see why. I'll break your face! They're serviceable in the role, just a bit amateur sounding compared to the rest of the cast, both in delivery and audio quality. I certainly respect the effort, he's clearly yelling his lungs out. But man, either he was recording on a phone or didn't know how to adjust his audio gain. The mic peaking seriously gets on my nerves. And to reiterate, he yells a lot. No! I want you shut the f up! Also, we've got Marissa Lenti as Noin and. Tomara Zordon? I think we all had a feeling that this guy was a floating head in a tube all this time who's been using an avatar to interact with us dark side style, but it is nice to see it finally confirmed. Molly does a good job overall. There are some great moments like the Mega Tiger Zord beatdown, cool sword play, and Epion's lightning fast moves, but it also feels kind of divided by the story beats, especially the whole future vision scene. It at least serves as foreshadowing to a death that's not bad for a black and white explosion, but this is a five minute fight that felt like it could have been two. I don't know, I feel like even if I was a fan of these franchises, I still wouldn't see it as anything other than okay. The audio quality is all over the place, the fighting is disjointed, and the dialogue feels less like a tribute to the cheese and more so a quirky commentary of it. Sadly, I couldn't come around on this one quite the same way I did with the last giant battle. Also, they say Rito Revolto could overload Tommy's connection to the Morphin Grid, even though earlier Boomstick said the Mega Tiger Zord never lost. Liar, liar, lazy writers. <laughs> okay, that was actually kind of funny. Welcome to hell. Ryu vs. Scorpion. No, I'm not gonna question why they decided to do this instead of Ryu vs. Liu Kang, because I'm too happy to finally get back to the kind of episode that's my bread and butter. Just two simple icons of fighting games. And while the whole Street Fighter vs. Mortal Kombat thing was definitely played out by now, I would posit this as the best one of the bunch. A big step up from Nick's last directing job. Both analyses are great at walking me through their stories. The diarrhea joke foot bit has stuck with me throughout most of my formative years. And as outdated as it is, the Dubstep music sting was surprisingly effective as a transition from Scorpion's tragic origin to the cool, goofier shit he could do now. Ryu's segment definitely could have toned it down on the Star Wars parallels, but the callback to Akuma's finger painting and Charlie Brown's Scorpion cancels it out. And so does this fight. I could not be happier that Zack is back. It feels like he had a lot more freedom here to go ham with the choreography. Not many sprite fights have the best hand-to-hand -hand fighting per se, but this is an easy exception. These two match each other blow for blow and are constantly one-upping each other on a advantage states and combos. The first portion is good stuff, but once we get these two close-up portraits, which I'm pretty sure are the first custom ones of the show, not bad in that regard. Scorpion brings the fight to hell and shit gets even crazier. I love this frenetic teleport combo being timed with the music, and even though there's no custom voice acting, these sound bites work great as banter. Apparently some of these clips on Ryu's end come from Gohan, which hey, props for creativity given they share the same voice actor. Neither of us have reached our full potential. 
Damn, a little out of character for Scorpion, cause that was ice cold! And yes, that faint sound you hear is indeed the clashing theme from Injustice. See why custom voice acting is the norm these days? But that sassy comeback was not as chilling as the evil Ryu transformation. It's not just the music shift and effects that sell me on the power, but the fact that Ryu punches a fireball and shatters a sword simply by blocking, whereas earlier he had to dodge. While Scorpion gets back up and dominates pretty handily, even this could be explained away by the another round power up, turning the fight into this intense battle of power creep. Both fighters trying their best not to reach their limit first. And once the flame of battle burns its brightest, it unfortunately fizzles out by the end. Not only was the power of nothingness a big ball of nothing, Scorpion's comeback is somehow worse. It's not just an underwhelming disintegration death. Why, hello, fellow PNG. It kinda ruins Scorpion's character too by making him into a goofy skeleton. <laughs> oh man, if they did this fight today, Hanzo would still have bits of skin hanging off, bloodied bruises, and a creepy ass skeleton face. Also, does anyone else hear toes instead of bones here? The ending may not be that great, but the rest was exemplary. Even though it uses some of the move spamming I complained about before, the faster pace and intense vibes more than make up for it. I'm still gonna campaign for Scorpion to get a run back like Ryu. How could you people not vote for this? But even now, I consider this one the gold standard for fighting game episodes. By the way, he should be saying that he's not me. Okay, because I came out like way before he did. Nah, I'm pretty sure you're Deadpool. Look into the camera and say something inappropriate. Deadpool versus Deathstroke. So here we have another Fulgor versus Sector situation of one episode not being ready yet, causing the other one to have to come out much earlier. And the similarities stop there, cause this bad boy is awesome! This matchup was perfect for Nick's jaded, almost biting writing style, which as we'll see later, doesn't always mix the best. Slate's got a really good analysis of making him feel unstoppable and still having great jokes. Batman vs. Captain America finally managed to justify its existence with this staring contest joke alone. But Wade's in particular caught me off guard with how well it holds up, especially for implementing a new milestone into the show, third party interruptions. This doesn't just lay the groundwork, it's still one of the best cases of it. Deadpool interrupts just enough to get his personality across while keeping up the pace of the rundown. Like how here, even though he interrupts Boomstick, he does it to keep the thought going so that he can talk about himself. And the sex jokes don't feel out of place either, cause, you know, it's freaking Deadpool. Wild to think the Deadpool oversaturation was a thing even before the Great Hollywood Calamity of 2016. Y'all might be wondering why I'm easy on Full Gore vs. Sector even though this episode faces a similar situation. Well, it's because of one key player that episode lacks, other than Takahashi. Torian has graced us with his incomparable style yet again. If Terminator vs. Robocop was a stretch, then this was a goddamn marathon. My god, this choreography is cracked! All the different weapons and fighting styles bounce off each other brilliantly. Even though this is the third match to take place in this admittedly cost-effective city environment, it manages to still have its own identity with the genius highway set piece. I didn't even know you could still see Deadpool's little body on each of the cars as he's taunting Slade. God, the way this episode fully utilizes the teleport Portation belt makes me so sad we've yet to see it used for the movies. Then the pileup begins and they fight on top of a bunch of cars suspended in midair. It's not like they stopped time or moved faster than the human eye could see. The cars just happened to be falling slower than these dudes were fighting, which is just so wonderfully nonsensical in the most perfect way for this kind of fight, without a doubt the highlight of the action. But it's not just their moves that clash. This was the definitive Deadpool matchup for a while since it gave him the perfect foil to his antics. Jason Marnoka keeps up the eat shit and die mentality throughout, only getting slightly more and more frustrated the longer it takes to kill this tumor-ridden nuisance. It's your lucky day. I can show you. Let's see what kind of mark this leaves on you. While he's a little exaggerated here, Deadpool steals the show. And unlike Spider-Man, who quips as a strategy, Wade is just so off the rocker and used to dying, he could hardly bother giving his opponent the satisfaction of a serious fight, right up until the moment he realizes Slade has a healing factor too, and could be an actual problem if the fight goes on any longer. There was no better Canuck for the job than Curtis Arnott, who I guess is just destined to play every single red and black gun-toting anti-hero in fiction. Not only is his line delivery perfect both in the analysis and the fight, it's meant to get under the skin of everybody who isn't the audience. For us, it's a delight seeing him take the piss out of getting shot in the head or fanning the flame wars. Shut up, Wade. Okay, Ben. I love it, dude. Hey, buddy, don't let me slow you down. Look at me. Look at me. Do not slow down. Pop, pop, watching Deathstroke. 
There's also something about Curtis's fighting grunts in particular that are just a special kind of charming to me that we never got again in his future episodes. It's cramping! The death isn't outstanding or anything, but it gets the job done balancing the cracked humor and brutality. I just wish we could have seen more of Jason playing up Slate's Berserker mode. And that's not the only downplayed Berserk form of the season. The sound design could get somewhat grating, namely the constant whooshes and especially that deafening sniper barrage. Ow! But this is exactly the kind of fight I would expect to play out between these two. Slade is the superior fighter, therefore coming out on top of most of their scuffles. And I love how Deadpool gets the upper hand the moment Slade calls him predictable, being downright offended at the mere notion and essentially saying, Challenge accepted, bitch. We're playing by my rules now. Torian was completely drunk when animating this entire breakdance sequence, and I'm happy to report that is not an exaggeration. Even the conclusion to their aerial duel shows off the difference in regeneration as Slade is severely debilitated by a sword, whereas Deadpool shrugs off a flame semi-truck to the face like a minor inconvenience. I love how that was foreshadowed in the analysis. It's crazy to say, but I think we've finally gotten to an episode on par with Goku vs. Superman. And it stars motherfucking Deadpool! Speaking of which, what, run out of annoying chime-ins? Are you kidding? I would never interrupt a gourmet chef while they're cooking up a five-star meal. This is exactly the kind of compliment shower I came here for. I can sleep well tonight knowing people haven't forgotten why this is the second most viewed episode of all time. Watch your monkey butt, Goku. I'm coming for ya. Have fun with the rest of your circus! Well, I'm glad that's at least over. Imagine being that guy's roommate. Spider-Man! I mean, Deadpool, shit! I love chocolate. But I can't eat it because then I'll get fat. But it's so good. Kirby, Kirby, Kirby versus Majin Buu. The streak keeps on going. This honestly might be one of my personal favorite stretches of episodes in the show's history. And this one in particular left an impact on me just as big as Goku versus Superman. Fitting for another Dragon Ball fight. And can I just say how happy I am they didn't abandon the franchise after how much shit they got from the fan base? And they couldn't have chosen a better match that I believe helped start one of the strongest and universally believed ideas on the internet. Kirby is the cutest eldritch abomination in all of fiction. And that's why we love him! Kirby has a super upbeat segment, which makes his crazy feats even funnier. Also, unlike with Rainbow Dash, Boomstick doesn't go, ugh, Kirby, he could never fight, but more like, aw, Kirby, he could never fight, oh, jeebus! But even after they've established him as a pink demon, it's still a cheery tone throughout. By contrast, Boo's is noticeably darker. We may call Kirby a monster in a playful way, but Boo is straight up terrifying, preparing us for the upcoming fight dynamic in the best way. Also, we finally got an ad break better than the one from Chun-Li versus My Sharanui. So into the vat you go, bitch. I love the Toy Story homage, and I wish we could get creative sponsorship skits like this more often. Remember how I said there would never be another Goku vs. Superman? I meant that and still mean it, but this certainly found its way into the ballpark, or wandered its way in knowing these two. Molly really seems to shine with non-stop frenetic battles like this one. Kirby is just as adorable and easy to root for here as I was expecting, and even the facial expressions, while out of place, provide a level of charm given the time it came out. They tried their best, and it's commendable to see these faces here at all. Plus, some give me genuine laughs. See, unlike Molly's last battle, uncharacteristic moments like this are more acceptable for Kirby since he's kind of a blank slate, at least in comparison. And those drops in action I mentioned are necessary here as they set up each section of the fight. I'm so glad they took advantage of these two being copiers to keep us on our toes by constantly evolving the dynamic, much like the last Dragon Ball fight. But once we get to the Kid Buu portion, that's where this episode becomes an entirely new beast. To address the elephant in the room, yes, this scene makes no sense and it's not at all how Kid Buu comes about in the anime. However, I'm willing to let that slide given both versions of Buu are utilized perfectly. Fat Buu is obviously more playful, and at points he and Kirby almost feel like brothers fighting over the controller or the last cookie. But the moment Kid Buu emerges from the stomach dimension, the fun and games are done, and the beatdown is merciless. Every time it feels like Kirby finds a win con, it gets snatched away. And as a kid, I got more and more scared for Kirby despite only having played a couple of his games. Once the Star Rod is destroyed and the sky turns purple, it seems like it's all over. Until we get a close-up of that tiny little Shekhov's gun we caught a glimpse of earlier. 
despite the muddy 3DS music. Again, I give them a break considering the time period. Seeing Kirby absorb the death ball and the shocked expression on Boo getting decked was one of the first times I genuinely cheered. Compared to other sun kills on its own, not the most exciting. But with the intense buildup from before, a moment of relief like this was what I needed. And that reveal right after cemented this episode as a classic. I can admit it's not the most polished episode. Some analysis jokes probably should have been reworded, and a good chunk of the presentation techniques are outdated. Not to mention, Kirby vs. Boo has one of the rockiest productions in the show's history. Originally being Kirby vs. Ditto, realizing that that would be super unfair, and needing to get rushed despite all the delays. That may not be hard to glean when watching the episode, but it's perfect to me, gosh darn it! It's still one of the longest sprite fights we've ever gotten, only beaten out by one that you won't fucking believe. The length was a fitting adaptation of Boo's story and how frustratingly unkillable the bastard was, making his saga by far the longest of Dragon Ball Z. After each and every beatdown and regeneration, you lose more and more hope that the pink puffball will prevail, making that final shot of Kirby transforming into the superstar we all know and love downright immaculate. I look forward to seeing how unpopular this is, but even though objectively speaking it's not the greatest, Kirby vs. Majin Buu has so much nostalgic value for me that not only is it my favorite of Season 2 so far, I'll be very surprised if that changes by the end. Ha! Take that, you annoying spider lasagna douchebag! Hem. <coughs> oh! Deadpool? Nathaniel? What, uh... What you doing here? I forgot my keys. Ah! I see. Did, uh... Did you check the cushions? Cause I'm always losing stuff... in there. Perhaps adult supervision is required for the rest of this thing? Okay. Oh, who wrote this shit? Ragna the Blood Edge versus Soul Bad Guy. Well, <laughs> the streak was fun while it lasted. If I had made this review as a kid, though, I'd probably get banned from the site, but in terms of rankings, I actually had this in my top 10, because the fight was cool and the analysis was hilarious. Looking back on it, though, while I can excuse the Goomba, Koopa, and even Starscream analyses, the disrespect is so blatant here that it gives Luigi's a run for its money. And yes, I'm mostly referring to Ragna's. So here's yet another episode affected by real-world circumstances, where the team assumed these two fighting games would be an easy writing job for Nick but they turned out to be a bit more complex than your run-of-the-mill street fight. This frustration is blatant in Wiz and Boomstick's commentary, specifically of the Blaze Blue plot. It's not even safe in the animation. The no one knows running gag crosses from playful jabbing territory into straight up disdain. I don't play the games or even Guilty Gear for that matter, but you instantly fail when even an outsider can tell the character deserves better. So much is skimmed over and hand waved all for the sake of telling jokes that you'd hear from Linkara. I learn nothing about the universes and feel bad for the fans who actually do enjoy these games. Either way, it's a lose lose. The battle is well animated. Zack has more than proven his consistency on that front, but it lacks any personality. With Ryu vs. Scorpion, I could feel their fighting styles, and seeing all their different abilities and weapons on display was awesome. For the most part, this was basically combo practice, barely taking advantage of the beautiful Arc System sprites. Using voice clips with different languages and an obvious disparity in quality was weird. This anime mask is but ugly, and even keeping in mind the lack of resources to pull a finale like this off, if it was done today, it'd still be lame as hell, since all it comes down to is a fuck-off explosion that cuts to soul in some spot that's supposed to be a destroyed town, but looks nothing like a destroyed town. I feel so weird about this episode. Like, I used to love it, but as I got older, I started to value character portrayal more than anything. And the one good thing about the analysis are some of the jokes, like the whole that man bit. We didn't even need boobs this time for YouTube to agree. There are so many better ways they could have handled these two franchises that have yet to get a run back. A good run back. Oh yeah? How would you do it? A what? No, 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 no! Go on, enrich us with your extensive fighting game knowledge. What nuggets of wisdom can you provide to criticize this nine-year-old episode constructively? I, uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh... Go on, say anything, and I mean anything at all. It could even be a positive should you dare to venture. I like the fire seal joke. 
My god, are you lucky that I came back. Look, Rizless the Rat here may not know what he's talking about, but if you want a more extensive breakdown of this episode from someone who does, check out Jonathan Frostathan's review. It's 30 minutes exclusively dedicated to Ragnar's soul and why it misrepresents both sides. I should know, I'm his editor, as well as the sole owner of a metric butt-ton of blackmail-worthy documents that could be used against him. Wait, what? Oh yeah, I've been meaning to ask. How can you sound different in those videos? I mean, do you really need to explain why I would have two different voices? Fair enough. This episode's lame. Only reason it's above Luigi's is because I'm a Mario fan. Moving on. Pocket sand. Ah! Gara versus Toph. So Kirby versus Boo was a pretty damn controversial fight at the time. I still love it. But Kirby wasn't yet truly accepted as the absolute unit and good Christian boy we know him as today. The point is, just because an episode is controversial, that doesn't mean it's bad. This episode was controversial, and it's bad. Which isn't even really why it was so controversial, but we'll get to that. For an episode that introduces Naruto and Avatar, these analyses are both equally boring to me. Despite the fact that I love Avatar and am only familiar with Naruto at face value. And if this was season 10 Boomstick, it would have been so easy for him to absolutely own Wiz for making the innuendo assumption. There would have been no coming back! Now, Naruto is a really big anime, and it's likely they weren't quite ready to tackle something of that scope yet without that same level of passion everyone had for Dragon Ball, and they certainly weren't ready for an Avatar episode. Or really anything with crazy element manipulation with only one animator per episode. The first minute starts off alright, the bending and jutsus are presented well enough, and the back and forth is acceptable. But once Gara encases himself in the sand sphere, things start to feel off. For starters, there's no battle music for this entire section, and we go from cocky banter to mundane conversing. It's out of place, doesn't complement the action, there's no tension building to justify the emptiness, and it's mostly there as a break from all the bending animation. It's the exact problem I had with dialogue-heavy fights in Season 1. Except somehow worse. It's not as funny as Vegeta vs. Shadow, and way more intrusive than Mario vs. Sonic. He-Man vs. Lino, this episode is not. But that's just the middle section. The ending really takes the cake. After we get this incomplete-looking sand wave, Toph busts out of the sand coffin and reveals her reality-warping abilities. Which is the only explanation I have, because it devolves into borderline nonsense. I don't get what the deal is with these pillars, we spend way too much time on this single particle trail, and then Toph pulls a Giovanni Potage as she teleports behind you, utilizing her special attack. It happens off screen, Gara's sprites look the exact same, and the only tell that he died was Chris Guerrero screaming. This is one of the worst deaths we've gotten so far, and the verdict is just as bad. The only reason given to Toph winning is that she can see Gara's sand. Well, I can see a chatterbox cesspool in my room with guns and swords, but I don't think that would help me in kicking him out of my house. That is the correct answer. They don't bring up any of the other powers Gara has besides sand, and they especially don't bring up the massive difference in power scale between their universes. Versus. In reality, the only reason this episode was so controversial was because of Naruto fans getting salty. Were none of the reasons I brought up before good enough for you? The beginning of the animation is fine, and I like Chris Guerrero and Kira Buckland's performances, even if the dialogue could have been implemented better. You do not belong here. This is sacred ground. Oh yeah, tough guy? Make me. It's not the worst of this season, and it is another victim of its time, but I don't dislike it just because of the shoddy verdict. In fact, Ben kind of puts it best himself. Fight's almost a little boring. <laughs> He does exactly what I do, but better. Boba Fett vs. Samus Aran, Remastered! Now see, this is why I decided to go in chronological order. Aside from it being a much easier method of scripting, there was no better way to show how far they'd come than to remaster the first episode. And keep in mind this is a remaster, not a rematch. The philosophy for this was to take the original script and adapt it to the more modern standards of the time, which makes it really fun to compare the jokes, for example, to see what returned as well as how some were expanded upon. The Sarlacc Pit gag was one of the better parts of the first episode, episode, and they make it even funnier here with that hypothetical. Also, since various things have changed over the roughly four years separating these two versions, it gave them more to talk about and enhanced the history, as well as a chance to join in on the topical fun of dunking on other M, as well as a really funny gag of pretending to end Boba's analysis like how Disney did, making this episode way more surreal in hindsight. Also, props to Boomstick for making just one comment about Samus's new Zero Suit and getting right back to the Arsenal stuff. I mean, they still kept the purse joke, but hey, at least it wasn't the final line again. They they even use the same end clips, but with Samus, the clip actually gets to the cool part without cutting too fast. Point is, their analysis segments have gotten much better. And that's not even mentioning Ben and Chad's own improved voices. But is the animation better? 
I mean, it's Torian. Are you surprised or something? Once again, it follows the same beats as the original, with the added sticky note to Torian to go buck wild as you please. Oh, and find a way to incorporate Zero Suit. We get some great slow mo impacts, the weapons sound awesome, and the lightsaber fight is the kind of thing where Torian shines the most. That includes the excessive backflips. But is there truly such a thing as excessive backflips? Yes, it's not acting like a whip, but that's no big deal. The budget's greater, but it's not that great yet. And having her gun act as this futuristic Swiss Army knife makes all the action beats lead into each other more naturally anyway, so screw it. The verdict gets the job done too, and I like how they bring up some of Samus's clients not even knowing she's a woman, which is sort of adapted in the animation where Boba has a slight moment of faltering after the suit comes off. Perhaps his employers told him he was after a man. But because Boba is all business, he respects his clearly skilled target enough to immediately put that surprise to the side and go all out in the final duel. It's crazy to think how much the show has been steadily evolving even eight years ago, especially if you compare this and Boba's more recent appearance. Though admittedly, I kinda like this one better. And a Samus run back would still kick ass. I'm positive Monty Elm would have been proud. Also, I swear to God, this dance scene used to have Godzilla in it. Don't you dare try to gaslight me, you sons of- Thank you, Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris versus Sega Ta Sanchiro. It's been a hot second since a good old fashioned gag episode, and even longer since a good gag episode. We got Chuck versus Sega Ta, right after the episode that we already knew the answer going into, and considering the way they were hyping these two up, it would have been surprising if it didn't have an ass pull ending. A little annoying to do this back to back, especially at a time when episodes were released every three weeks instead of two, but hot damn does this blow away one gag fight and slowly waterboard the other to make it think about what it did. This is how you should do an episode using a real life person. Using it as a chance to focus more on the myths surrounding them, while throwing sprinkles of biography in for unique storytelling. I remember when everyone at my school and online would make constant Chuck Norris jokes, and this episode managed to capitalize on the craze right as it was getting past A. Yet somehow, it doesn't feel dated because of how seriously Wiz and Boomstick take these facts in real life documentaries. Massive props to Nick for accomplishing that. And unlike the last episode where they went in knowing one of the characters wouldn't be recognized by many, they did an incredible job building up Sega to as Chuck's equal and ludicrous badassery. And the whole tangent about proving he was still alive made sense to include given the limited footage they had to work with, and it was a natural way to match the runtime to Chuck's and eventually establish the same thing for both. These are two all-powerful gods repping two sides of a globe that is all but fucked the moment they throw hands. The setup is incredible for connecting these two and their television claims to fame. Of course Chuck would be watching his own show, and of course he'd somehow get commercials for a console that has been discontinued for decades. Sega Top finally decided to step back into the limelight, and it was to defeat the one man who could possibly measure up. Usually, battles start off small and escalate, which this battle certainly does, but even the first hits feel massive in power. This choreography is jam-packed with references to their legends and commercials, made even better by all of it being established before in the analysis. I still can't believe Zack managed to visually get across what running so fast you punch yourself in the back of the head would look like. I love the sound cue after all the Sega Tuz appear. In fact, just about all the sound design is great. And the destruction of this episode shows nearly all the tiers of versus debating. You nerds know the ones. From wall to building to mountain to planet to galaxy to reality itself. Who cares if this battle seems a little far-fetched for them? Especially Segata, admittedly. That's not the point of this episode. That's why the ending doesn't feel like a cop-out compared to Eggman vs. Wily. We knew what we were in for. A nutty battle of internet memes clashing together for a fight somehow far more destructive than Goku vs. Superman. This fight. Some of the backgrounds are a little cut off, and this line used for Chuck is way too quiet. But any complaints I could have about other episodes don't really work here. It's not often we get gag episodes, but I'm so glad this this one set a solid precedent for how good they can be. Even if this battle is too unconventional for you, there's no denying its legacy. To this day, it continues to be referenced, and the fact that they're still fighting even now makes this episode even better. Kamen Rider Ichigo better have a Segata reference in his battle, no matter how subtle. I'm especially glad it came out when it did. Aside from Chuck Norris jokes being a really weird thing to reference these days, we wouldn't have been able to hear moments from Segata's commercials or his theme throughout the segment. Is it weird for a 20-year-old dropout making video essays? says to tear up at the sound of a Japanese man belting out his own anthem. Uh, Don't answer that. Never ask questions you aren't willing to hear the truth to. Oh, you idiots! 
We all got swords! Guts versus Nightmare. And I thought Harry versus Luke had a funky connection. Giant swords, yeah! Those have never been on death battle before. To be fair, it is meant to be a sort of battle of opposites. One's a demon possessing a human, the other's a human that slaughters demons. Plus, Guts and Siegfried are both constantly fighting internal and external demons while wearing corruptive armors and seeking out vengeance. Wait, shouldn't this have been Guts versus Siegfried? I wouldn't be surprised if this battle existed solely to sell people on Berserk by giving Guts a super powerful demonic opponent right in line with this home series. To their credit, they succeeded, and so many people were introduced to Guts through this episode. My one problem with it, though, is that unlike with Kirby's analysis starting the trend of him being a cute demon, which is awesome, after this episode, it kind of felt like people forgot about the more introspective and tender side of Berserk, which isn't as doom and gloom as you might think. Anything that is loses its humanity, making it harder for the audience to get attached in any way. <coughs> uh, Kame got killed. <coughs> Luckily, this was remedied eight years later, so I can better appreciate the amount of reverence they have for him. A far cry from the emo and Green Day jokes of our last anime character. Nightmare's analysis is fine, but not quite as impactful or focused. I haven't played Soul Calibur, so if Inferno needs to possess a body, who the hell is Siegfried fighting in this scene? And who exactly are these two chicks? They seem pretty important. I had to research that shit on my own. But they ended on the fly -ear joke, so that's okay, I guess. Here's a fight that I've adored for so long. And nowadays, it's still pretty good. Guts gets the shit beaten out of him. But it feels fitting to what he's known for, as well as the type of otherworldly opponent he's dealing with. He'll just keep on trucking no matter the pain. Leading to my absolute favorite shot of him jumping through that wall of fire to disarm Nightmare. The epitome of badass stubbornness. The choreography may not be that crazy, but it's all brought together by this episode's biggest selling point. And the main reason I've been blind to any valid criticisms of it, the sound design. The swords clanging together have so much wonderfully metallic reverb. And when Nightmare transforms, all it takes is one clash to know that things are looking a lot bleaker with a more ominous and hollow tone to it. That's not to mention the impact of these trees being cut down, landing on the rocks, the decapa slice. If I was just judging the sound design, this would be a 10 out of 10 but it can't carry everything. I get that this part is slow motion, but it's also just a very odd interaction. It sounds more like Guts is getting his face ripped off, not just a cut. Maybe this episode's sound design is too impactful for its own good. And then Nightmare gets hit by a single cannonball and is probably hurt by it? Then we just kinda stand around a while, confused, and HOLY SHIT NIGHTTERR IS HERE, THIS IS SICK! But everything falls apart by the time we get to the climax, if you can even call it that. Inferno shows up, and yes, I know, that's actually Cinder, but ju just let him have this, guys. The Berserker armor comes out, and then everything's over from a single strike. That is actual dookie, my guys. Like, what the hell were Wiz and Boomstick so scared of? Inferno's a total punk! And remember all that talk about the armor causing Guts to give in to his darkest urges and letting him fight until every drop of blood has been spilled? Nah, we're chilling. I understand that resources weren't plentiful. Welcome to the party, Cinder. May I take your hat? But clearly something needed to be cut from earlier so that we could get a better climax. Or at least a climax. Maybe have a shorter intro, or even have Night Terror come out sooner. And if the fight didn't feel that Guts leaning to you, then stick around for the verdict. Even though Nightmare is leagues more powerful and has tons of destructive magic, this is what Guts does every single day. He's got it. It's a little hard to see this episode as anything other than hyping up Berserk, which it does in spades, but everything else, even down to the opponent chosen, doesn't feel as curated. Like, sure, Nightmare dominates for most of it, but that kind of feels like it's trying to say, yo, look at all this insane shit Guts is tanking, and he only needs one sword slice for the final form, whoa! And remember, I'm the guy that defends Starscream versus Rainbow Dash. There's still plenty to love about this episode's presentation, except for the thumbnail, holy shit, that's barren. Zack Watkins knocks it out of the park on the sprite rigging, and it's pretty cool to see Death Battle's take on an underdog hero fighting tooth and nail to finally dethrone a powerful villain. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? Just a flesh wound. Come on, then. All right, we'll call it a draw. Eat the rich! Iron Man versus Lex Luthor. Literally the next episode, and we already have a fight that takes the concept I just said and does it even better. And that's really the best way to describe this episode. A more earned version of Guts versus Nightmare. It is Torian, though, so that's to be expected. A battle of two billionaires using tech to fight alongside and against gods. Yet the paths they chose to take their boundless intellects couldn't be further from each other. The analysis segments are great at establishing both characters' origins, though after that, they 
they do kind of drag a little bit. Like, I'm glad they thoroughly explained all the armors and technology that show up in the fight, but then both kind of devolve into anecdotes of the crazy shiz they both did. Especially Lex's. They go on about five different tangents for him, and don't really give any numbers either to justify it. It's either to show how smart or stubborn he is. Also, Tony's an alcoholic. If that seems like a weird way to end this section, I'm just doing what the episode told me to. Luckily for us, these gripes are eclipsed by the nearly seven minute long fight. Oh man, as hero versus villain fights go, this one is absolutely the ideal. It's a battle of two egoistic geniuses with different ways of showing it. Tony is on the back foot for most of it, and this was a fantastic direction to take the fight. It shows off his ability to think on the fly, constantly changing his battle strategies, while Lex gets to gloat and strut his insane tech as this massive hurdle for Tony to come out on top of. The warehouse section has a ton of fun easter eggs to spot, and overall has a lot of my favorite banter here. Tony can't help but be a little shit even when taking a Hulk-like beating, and he's mostly concerned with how much the collateral is gonna cost since they're in his wife's warehouse. It's really funny. Typical greedy billionaires. As for why the Batmobile is there, I suppose Pepper knew Bruce wouldn't be using it anytime soon. After that, we get the Hulkbuster section that's more about throwing hands. It's the biggest streak of hits Tony gets up to this point as the more natural fighter, and it's pretty damn great to see Lex get his justice desserts. As if the guy didn't have enough already. Though this doesn't last very long, yet despite the power in his suit dropping fast, Tony will not relent and even catches Lex off guard for a moment. Just a moment, of course. This is Gianni Matragrano's first foray into death battle, everyone's favorite ambassador of Impact Font memes. He is great at making Lex feel like this imposing force of bureaucratic mania. To him, Tony is nothing more than a punk with too much money trying to be a god. I like how this even prompts him to compliment his arch nemesis. Respecting someone ain't the same as liking them. Call that power. You are nothing. I have seen true power. You are nothing more than another ant to crush under my... How about that? Thanks for the fun, Stark. It was smashing. Chuck Huber, of all people, plays Tony. He's got an ego, too, but Chuck is great at playing it in a more cheeky way to mess with his opponent and perhaps boost his own confidence. I thought you were smart. Hey, you're the one who looks like a giant rusty trash can with legs. No judging. It's basically MCU dialogue, but one of the better showcases of it since it's actually funny here. And Jay Britton as Jarvis is a nice inclusion. He has great chemistry with Tony on the same level as Tommy and Saba. Actually, sir, I should probably remind you, the contents of this warehouse belongs in this box. I'll forward the estimated damages fee to her account. Great. Be discreet about it. I estimate that will be a $583 million fee. Whoa! But Chuck's voice shines the most in the climax, which might be the biggest thing this episode has over Guts vs. Nightmare. Not only does it actually have one, it's one of the best in the whole series. Tony rebutting Lex's monologue by claiming to have been a god from the very beginning, followed by an explosive shot of speed that Lex can barely even keep up with is an exciting and satisfying comeback, not to mention fantastic music choice. But I think I love Tony's everything response even more. Leading into the raw as fuck moment of Lex getting ripped right out of his suit in a single grab, which feels much more earned than the single strike from before, by the way, since Tony had to actually work for it to set the move up. We could have ended it there, but leave it to Tony to go with the far more over-the-top and fun option. It's disintegration, sure, but I won't deny that it's probably the most hype way to do it, and that kind of death wasn't as commonplace at the time. Again, could have ended there, but then we get this charming scene of levity between Tony and Pepper, played by Marissa Lenti, and the utter confusion in her voice as Tony sounds way more terrified here than at any point earlier in the fight is hilarious! This episode's got all the makings of a timeless masterpiece, but it doesn't quite reach that level for me. I can't ignore how awkward the analysis sections feel to me at points, and while Torian is incredible, this battle has a couple quirks that don't sit right with me. A lot of movements can feel very mo y and these visual effects are too overexposed. I really hope Torian didn't animate these bits in the dark, and while Gianni is a king, a couple of his reads are a tad funky, as well as his credit. That's rough, buddy. I remember when I first applied to this job and spelled Raccoon Bro's name with just one C. Still can't believe the dude hired me after that massive tantrum. I still love this episode, and I can see why this is a lot of people's favorite. It only falls ever so slightly short of a 10 for me. It's still an impressive battle of a dauntless hero triumphing over a big mean scary adversary that Torian definitely had fun animating, especially the part of dragging Lex up the building. So many hype moments, but man, it's still mind-blowing to me that they got Chuck Huber. He's my hero. 
Uh, excuse me? You know, Android 17, Dr. Stein, EA, what's not to love about him? Well, if you're such a big fan, you should uh, check out his Twitter. He says a lot of entertaining stuff there. Hey, yeah, I should do that. That was deeply upsetting. I wonder if Tony's a flat earther too. I mean, the dude's been to space, so he'd probably know better than anyone. Keep in mind, that is the only thing Raccoon Bro gave me the go-ahead to mention on camera. You wanna watch Super Android 13 after this? Maybe Yu Yu Hakusho? How about Soul Eater? Why must you be this way? Mr. Beast vs. Goliath is... BORING! The analyses are boring, the overabundance of clips is boring, the sprites are boring, the choreography is boring! Portraying these two as savage beasts the entire fight instead of saving it for the climax, which goes completely against the point of their connections, is boring! The death is boring! The golden tree misdirection actually isn't that boring. It's fucking infuriating is what it is! And... and... no, oh, this episode is boring! I can't believe I have to dedicate a whole section to this nothing episode! I mean, you kinda already did. Uh, why'd I just move on? Uh, no, I have to review it properly, otherwise I'll piss off all the actual fans. What actual fans? Well, you... Yeah. Hmm. Sneaking. We're sneaking. 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 Solid Snake versus Sam Fisher. And just like that, back to peak fiction. And it's Torian again. Seriously, what is this season? Well, if it gave us episodes like this, it's hard to complain. Both rundowns are super solid stuff. I felt like I was properly walked through their stories in spite of how infamous Metal Gear's plot is. The use of clips here isn't nearly as annoying since it had plenty of substance to round it out. Not to mention some of them are pretty funny. In fact, Sam's has a lot of my favorite jokes from this season, like Wiz being legit concerned over Boomstick's horniness, the two of them laughing over the thought of a super <laughs> soldier getting to have a normal life, and the classic Churro story set to the lovely visual of dog murder. Very nice. Alright, so this may not be a hero versus villain dynamic like the last 3D episode, but this one has an even bigger focus on story. Not only hitting the 7 minute mark this time, but getting to 7 and a half, which is insanely close to Goku versus Superman's. Again, without the cold open. Funny thing is, that runtime isn't filled with balls to the wall action like others. Instead, it's a much more methodical, slow burn, with instances of action spread out while our fighters consult with their guys and gals in the chair. This is unlike anything Death Battle had done. And even now, it's tough to compare this one to any future episodes without stretching. And yet the storytelling is so good that it manages to be one of the series' best despite the minimal action. I'd like to start with everything surrounding that narrative before I get to the fighting. And the fact that I can say narrative about a Death Battle episode is a little crazy. Love how we get details of the mission brief before the top secret parts get crossed out. This opening feels like the beginning to a mission straight out of Metal Gear. Mission objective. Infiltrate the enemy base and retrieve important data. But much to their surprise, there's only one enemy to deal with, which is immediately a red flag to Snake and Otacon, who are used to whole groups. Of course, Snake takes it in stride like the soldier he is, not knowing this one heat signature isn't the kind of enemy they were anticipating, as he had already taken care of the actual goons beforehand with ease. Once the two meet up, it doesn't take them long to realize they're after the same thing. Now that the one source has been destroyed by Sam, the entire fight becomes this intense game of cat and mouse, and it's never quite clear who's chasing who. This is such a brilliant way to incorporate their stealth mechanics into the fight, and every time one of them escapes, it leads to lengthy dialogue sequences of everyone trying to figure out what's up with the other party while reflecting on the situation. As an audience member, it's exhilarating to get an idea of their next plans of attack while leaving out just enough information to give genuine surprises. Not to mention the ways they stealth out of combat and manage to throw in levity too by incorporating some of the more outlandish yet fun sides of Metal Gear with the cardboard box and the really funny exclamation moment before they throw down for real. What makes the plot truly special is how the characters drive the story. Even when Sam could have reasonably left with the data, his personality of relying on hunches was a great way to keep him on the playing field. Same for Snake, who was too injured to make a run for it and had to make sure Sam never tried to come back for the drive. As great as the writing is, of course it wouldn't have hit the same without the marvelous cast. Ben Reynolds and Whitney Rogers are great as Sam and Grimm. You really get the impression that they've been working together for years, with their bickering almost akin to an old married couple. New friend it won't last long. There's only one way into that room. Don't lecture me. He's fine. That was close. You're welcome, by the way. I lost the data. Oh. Wonderful. Brad Van Abel as Otacon is one of my favorites. His soft-spoken delivery is soothing and bounces off a of Snake's colder tone. But Snake, 
Until we know what you're up against, I suggest you keep yourself out of sight. I've already got it covered. Please tell me it's not a cardboard box. And of course, we can't go without mentioning Snake's voice actor, Christopher Sabat. I'll admit he's not really doing a David Hayter impression. That voice is so hard to replicate without coming off as try-hard. Ugh, Metal Gear. But Sabat's interpretation still gets the job done in this context and just sounds cool. I know it's not for everyone, but I still love it. Thanks, Otacon. Piece of cake. Otacon, I've got the intel. And Deadpool, if you try to ruin another voice actor for me, I swear. Ooh, that is a fantastic idea. I should go check. Deadpool? Like I said, the action isn't frequent, but those few bouts we do get are incredible bursts of excitement carried by Torian's hand to hand prowess, which at this point he's become a master at. Which is very important for two characters like these who are meant to be the best in their field. Again, though, I really like how stealth is more of a focus here since that's how their games are played. They only resort to fighting under strenuous circumstances. But when the blades do come out, it's a hardcore struggle for survival. The climax is not only beautiful, but quite possibly the best one they've ever done. Sam has been cut off from his eye in the sky, and even the lights start to slowly go out. So he dons his gear and plunges into the abyss of darkness for one last push, with the only source of illumination being his goggles, a cigarette, a solid eye, and the various shots coming from their guns. Holy hell, are these visuals equal parts scary and mesmerizing. Brad Venable lets out a bone chilling, Yay! which they kinda had to include here. And after finally shedding proper purple light on the building, Sam gets disarmed. And after all the close shave run-ins, our two spies are left to their bare essentials. A simple knife fight is the last thing standing between them and their destinies. The Shin Megami Tensei music reaches its climax, and we get such a raw, unfiltered exchange of slashes, any of which could be fatal, until it all comes to a head. And as funny as it is how Snake pulled off a better version of this kill than Spawn did, I'm very glad they skipped out on the original death, where Snake apparently would break every single bone in Sam's body. Like, damn, all at once? That would have felt way too over the top and not in line with this episode's grounded tone. This is without a doubt my favorite directing job from Nick. He knew that two characters like this from story-driven stealth games needed to be adapted in a way far outside this show's comfort zone. We almost never get down-to-earth fights that are more focused on the fighter's psychologies over building-destroying explosions and flashy fighting game combos. This was just as much a battle of minds, making the secondary support such a seamless inclusion. But without that slow burn dedicated to the engaging dialogue and fakeouts, I don't see this episode working in any other season. This isn't just a product of its time, it's a blessing of its time that still holds up today. Piece of cake. What are you a doctor of anyway? I'm a podiatrist. Darth Vader versus Doctor Doom. To preface, this is Molly's last animation with the show. I have loads of respect towards the guy for being the first sprite animator to carry on the torch after Lang left, and he did such a great job building upon that foundation with his own style. Now that I've established that, I can say without any qualms that this episode sucks. Like Luigi versus Tails levels of disrespectful. Save for the analysis, this was a much better rundown of the Star Wars universe compared to last time. Though as great as James Earl Jones is, they might have been a bit too eager to use his voice clips so frequently. And hey, we get the poultry science origin for Boomstick, though frankly the part that sells me on the joke is that his university president is aptly named President. As for the fight, I hate to say it, but even Lang had a better swan song than this. Minor nitpick, I'm not a fan of the voice clips used. Like obviously you gotta go the Jones route for Vader, but next to Paul Dobson's more over the top fighting game voice on Doom's end, the two do not mesh together tonally at all like Ryu vs Scorpion do. This first half of the fight isn't so bad. The trading of abilities is decent. I really love the use of the force, and this shot of Doom getting thrown into the camera is pretty funny. Since this is the beginning, this fight has the chance to ramp it up and take things to even cooler heights. And then it's revealed that it's been a Doom bot the whole time, rendering all of the damage and cool stuff Vader did up to that point completely moot. Hey, come closer. I want to let you in on a little secret. Vader doesn't get a single other advantage state for the rest of the fight. <laughs> My guys, this isn't Starscream, this is Darth Goddamn Vader. You do not treat this guy like a jobber. Normally, I don't take issue with stomps on paper, but I do whenever it affects the fight in such a way that the characters aren't represented properly. Vader should be this imposing wall of sheer willpower, too angry to die. And yet, once Doom actually starts fighting, he dispatches him effortlessly, only ever getting hit by what I'm convinced is a fluke. 
God, this dinosaur section is terrible. The only thing the second half has over the first is me being able to actually see Vader's sprites properly. But even then, they're so stiff to begin with that might have been for the best. The only thing Vader gets to do in this portion is decapitate a shitty looking dinosaur. And that only happened because Victor threw him into it. For the rest of the fight, he's ragdolled, his powers are useless, and he's dispatched in probably the most disrespectful way you can for his character. Even Luigi was treated better than this. I said it, and I'm sticking to it! At least he actually got a couple meaningful beatdowns. Any that Vader got didn't even matter because he was fighting a goddamn robot the whole time. That can somehow bleed. Aside from the poultry science reveal, not even the analysis sections could save this episode since they ended up being done way better anyway, and overall haven't aged the best. Meaning there's very little reason to ever revisit this one. Uh, unless you're like me and making a review of every episode from season 2. And if that's the case, who hurt you? This shit was so forgettable, even Raccoon Bro forgot to include it in his Mr. Blue Sky tribute. Okay, come on, Nate, you can do this just a little bit longer. What's next? I hope you like sequels! No! I am depressed. This does not help. Goku vs. Superman. Too. Well, this was kinda inevitable. Even back in 2015, the signs were all there, which you may or may not have picked up on throughout this review. We got Superman being referenced twice in the season premiere, the Masako X cameo in Kirby vs. Majin Buu, the Deadpool callout, and a bunch of other visual cues. It was a matter of when, not if. Too bad that when could not have been worse timing. I'll be honest, y'all. This whole project radiates bad vibes to me. The only reason it exists is because the team gave in to constant demand from the fans to include Goku's latest form, which we barely knew anything about since Super hadn't even been announced yet while the episode was being worked on. You'd think the analysis would focus more on this new form, but again, because we had so little to go off of at the time, it's essentially a footnote on the same level of Clark's new move, which doesn't even get used in the fight and is just an obligatory inclusion to make it seem like this episode isn't just catering to Dragon Ball fans. The rest of that runtime is presented almost like a documentary, which is a weird direction to take a death battle analysis. If you couldn't already tell, most of this analysis is the leftovers from Goku vs. Superman's original 50-minute script. And while I get what they were going for, it feels so unfocused. I could appreciate an unconventional structure, but this whole commentary over different cultures and the debate itself is borderline out of character for this show. Like, this history BS was probably cut from the original episode for a reason. It's too meta for its own good. And this season at Deadpool, that's saying something. And that's ultimately what keeps me from liking this episode comparing it to the original. That one may have had a padded conclusion, but the sequel's verdict is just as long if not longer, has no clear direction, and all it really boils down to is saying Superman is an unrelatable, limitless god who can never lose over and over again, which is a much more disrespectful version of the philosophy I adored from last time. Pretty bold of you to claim Clark's unrelatable when earlier in the episode you were talking about how his authors were the sons of Jewish immigrants and used Superman as an outlet for how they too felt like aliens. Nothing relatable at all there! And speaking from personal experience, I can relate to Clark in that way too. I can't stand when people default to calling Superman a boring character. He could be an amazing, inspirational hero when handled correctly. I may love Goku more, but the way this episode so clearly prefers him and is busy playing damage control after his loss doesn't sit right. Even Ben has gone on record saying this is his least favorite episode, since they made the fatal error of presenting it as a rematch when really it's more like an addendum. But I guess Goku vs Superman 2 is more marketable than Goku vs Superman New Funky Mode. Wait, what am I talking about? That sounds hype as fuck. The point is, this episode only exists as a fan for the Flame Wars. Luckily, things have calmed down dramatically since then. But that doesn't excuse this episode for essentially being used as a stick to prod one of the most violent groups on the internet. Anime fans. I was originally considering giving this episode a zero. To me, a zero out of ten should be given to things that have no reason to exist and add nothing of value, while a one out of ten is just a normal terrible episode. But then I gave it more thought, and I'd rather not imply that anything is on the same level as the mistake. And there are a couple things to appreciate about this episode. Torian does a spectacular job as always, and I wasn't expecting this to reach the same highs as the first fight. He was the sole 3D animator at the time putting out content every other episode. Obviously he wasn't gonna pump out another crazy 10 minute fight like that. Though that character driven core from the first one, something not nearly as dependent on budget, is virtually non-existent. The fight simply lacks personality and comes off more as 
Oh god, I wanted to avoid this word so bad, especially for a Dragon Ball fight. But this is just boring cape shit. No fun character interaction, no trading of strategies, none of their wackier powers or tools show up, Goku and Clark themselves are unlikable wet blankets, and that ending skit is 8,000 times worse than the skit from the first one. At least that one didn't make me cringe or spout off the same reasoning from last time that also continues to get drilled into the ground for the rest of this sequel. It's a well-animated fight, but the true emerging star to come from this episode and the main justification for its existence, the grand debut of Brandon Yates. Alive is an incredible rock song that not only sounds exciting and adds so much to the canyon section, but serves as an explosive introduction to one of Death Battle's most important and long-standing contributors. But I can just listen to that song on my own whenever I want, especially the remaster from 2019. Same goes for the Blake Robinson score, leaving this episode with no real purpose for existing other than to rub salt in the wound. At least Beast vs. Goliath doesn't dump on a previous episode's legacy, thus reaffirming my stance from last time. There will never be another Goku vs. Superman. And I think it's safe to say that Goku vs. Superman 3 will never happen either. Not that they'll never do this matchup again, but if- When? If they do, it's more likely to be a sort of Goku vs. Superman 2025 situation, where it's a full-on re-evaluation using modern standards of research. They've gotten enough shit by now to know that the former option is a bad idea. I realized this was a really confused segment. But this episode in general is confused, so that's showbiz for ya. I don't blame Ben at all for not looking back on this episode fondly. It was supposed to be a simple follow-up, but then it got turned into the main event at SGC, which was not at all what he wanted nor expected. I'd be a little upset too for getting set up like that. But hey, gotta give him props for putting on a fun live show. And while I still don't like the one-sided climax in comparison to the dramatic struggle from last time, I can appreciate going for a much tamer kill than before. Crazy to think I've been at this crap for 50 episodes already. At least we've finally gotten to the end of another- Wait, how much time is left? And again, he could be twirling his dick! Donkey Kong vs. Knuckles. Yep, even when it seemed like we'd reached an obvious closer, Season 2 just decided to keep on going, I guess. Cause that's the kind of pipeline we're dealing with. I know some of y'all might be thinking, where the fuck do we go from here? Well, I'm happy to say they went with a much more goofy matchup to help calm things down. And we've yet to get to the goofiest of them all. Analyses are fun for the most part, but also pretty weird too. DK's has a great opening line about the jungle, and it's fun comparing him to real life gorillas. But it also does the Goliath thing of playing way too many clips from the cartoon. Albeit much less frequently at least, and was meant for poking fun at it. But Knuckles is even weirder. Sonic and Knuckles would go on to form a tense bromance. Proceeds to show a clip of Knuckles and Rouge that has nothing to do with Sonic. Also, there's a lot of penis talk, so I hope that floats your boats. I'm also just not big on using the spin-off cartoons to paint both of them as way dumber than their usual incarnations, but this is early death battle, so I just kinda accept that. Also, fuck you, Robot Moon, for being another Golden Tree moment. Luckily for us, though, Zack is back on that sprite shiz. And this may be one of the most expressive fights we've gotten yet. I know that Donkey Kong gets a lot of crap for his design here, but it doesn't bother me that much, cause for one, he's a friggin' ape. I'm not expecting him to be well kempt. And his facial animation is so wonderfully expressive and breathes so much life into his character that earlier episodes would have been limited at portraying. In fact, DK in general is really fun here, getting into a fight cloud with himself and looking so positively dumbfounded at this hole. There were a lot of great music choices that fit the jungle tone while throwing in some funky tones as well for Knuckles. Why does this opening animation of the guitar riff go so hard? The whole oh no running gag somehow didn't get old since it's basically canon, and ended up being really funny due to how ungodly relentless those damn coconuts were. Even when Knuckles was stripped down to his knuckles, he couldn't escape their wrath. It even leads to a really fun back and forth of the two of them fighting while the coconuts are going haywire. And Knuckles is even able to bounce some of them back. The fight on land is really great, with only some oddities like DK learning how to teleport, but after the fantastic sequence of Knuckles burrowing and a really funny payoff to the coconut bit, the minecart section isn't nearly as exciting for me. Like, yeah, we get a few punches, and then for the rest of it, they're hanging off this wall while slapping and punching it over and over. I understand that's their thing, but it gets old after a while. The death is alright, but it's pretty laughable how they tried to present it as a fake out even after we clearly saw Knuckles turn to fine red mist. Well, the dude is red, so it can be hard to tell. I can certainly relate. Oh, really? Yep. To tell you the truth, I have been bleeding throughout this whole segment. Accidentally sat on one of my knives. Doesn't that hurt you? Oh, immensely. Thanks for asking. 
Look, all I could ask for after the last entry was a breather, and DK vs. Knuckles is a good episode to turn your brain off to. Which I suppose fits its theme. Oh hey, this is the first episode to credit Liam Swan. <laughs> that guy's fun. Dude. What are you fucking talking about? Somebody's gotta get stabbed! Wolverine vs. Raiden. Huh, damn, another Torian episode already? I mean, I won't complain, obviously. But by this point, the dude has been single-handedly responsible for every other fight. That's four to seven minute long 3D animations almost once a month. And while this one may not be my favorite per se, it probably has my favorite choreography of the whole season. So first off, the analysis is very solid stuff. I like the confusion towards Metal Gear and Boomstick's insistence to move on to the cool stuff. But I'm also not a big fan of how both rundowns choose to not really end. In fact, we get almost nothing on the story of Revengeance. Though to be fair, that game wasn't nearly as much of a meme machine as it is now. They made Twitter into a plot point. It makes both rundowns feel incomplete despite the good writing. But once that fight kicks in and the metal starts striking, I choose to forgive it. So even though we just had a Metal Gear episode not too many months ago, that doesn't matter due to how insanely different they are. Where that one was more focused on building suspense through engaging dialogue, this one is high octane, non-stop action the whole time. And it's frankly glorious. Who cares if they have little reason to fight? That's not what matters for this one. And I genuinely don't think the lack of motivation should be considered much of a detriment when this is the main focus. Like. Just look at this! I love how so many of the moves are adapted straight from the game. And while it can be easy to see Logan as just a punching bag, what keeps this fight from feeling one-sided is how damn determined these two are. Logan keeps getting back up with a healing animation that's always been weirdly satisfying to me, while continually perplexing Raiden. Who? No. What is this guy? Even when Logan tells him outright, it's still not a cakewalk. Even going as far as to keep attacking him while having the sword lodged in his stomach. I don't know how you can tell me with a straight face that all Wolverine does is tank punishment when you've got moments like the Marvel vs. Capcom combo and using his freaking claws to scale the building Raiden was hoping to use as a moment of rest. The rooftop scene also just has a lot of the best action bits in general, giving us legit close quarters back and forth on the same level as Snake's episode, with the added technologically and chemically enhanced Flair. Kids, remember, never do drugs. Except for when it's really, really based. I also find some of the smaller character moments neat too, like Raiden throwing this crushed cell away, or Logan sniffing for bubble blowing babies. And unlike our last episode, this super fun action is actually tied together perfectly with an outrageously sick climax where both characters go into berserker mode. For real this time, I promise. The actors shine especially here. Tim Page is a nice sound alike for Quentin Flynn and has several great moments of intensity, especially after letting the Ripper out. <laughs> It's time for Jack the Ripper to let her rip! Shit! Not again! But once again, Xander Mobus steals the show as Wolverine, feeling just like Cal Dodd right out of the 90s cartoon. He sounds so in his element, even making lines like the nose nose sound badass. No use hiding, bub. The nose nose. Nice trick, Voltron. I'm actually more human than you. That's saying something. But the voices aren't the only thing that elevate these transformations. Up to now, we've been hearing EXO, another great track by Brandon Yates. It cuts out right after Raiden's latest beatdown as Logan starts to cool himself off, only to lose that cool for a dramatic shift in the power dynamic, as well as a fun callback to Raiden's game so that the camp isn't lost. But holy crap does that Jack the Ripper scene still hold up, using the music and dialogue of the game as well as focusing on the reds of Raiden's mutilated body as he charges up for one last barrage. It's an incredible display of blinding fast slashes until Raiden finally gets an opening. And this made my jaw drop. Something I didn't think the show was capable of doing again since Goku vs Superman. Not by blowing up a planet, but by showing a character we all thought was impenetrable finally get Penna defeated. Just tell me when it's over, I can't stand to look. Too bad, Deadpool, cause this scene demands your attention, as is evident by the slow-mo and dip in music, driving home the weight of this seemingly impossible thing actually happening before our very eyes. Even though it's not nearly as dramatic as its sibling, I've gotta give props to this episode for not only having dumb fun action, but finding a way to give me legit goosebumps. I can't think of a better pair of episodes to represent both sides of a series so faithfully. Sucks we wouldn't get another comparison page until friggin' season 9, huh? Damn. And I am the one who took him down! 
Is there a body, Mr. Satan? No! Hercule Satan versus Dan Habiki. Pretty damn bold of the team to do another Dragon Ball fight with Mr. Satan a mere three episodes after Satan Incarnate. And not only did they use one of the joke characters, they somehow gave him the longest sprite fight of the entire show, a record previously held by another Dragon Ball character. It's not even close! While this technically isn't a gag episode, episodes that break apart from the usual death battle mold, it's still its own beast. You know how most of my least favorites up to now have been because of the characters getting needlessly shat on or not getting to shine enough in the fight? Well, this episode is built on the foundation of making fun of its characters as blatantly as possible. And it actually works. Namely, because they're staying true to the way they're presented in their home series. If they were treated with the same level of reverence as Snake or Godzilla, it would have made the episode worse. That's not what's fun about these two. The fact that they're somehow still alive in worlds with powers far beyond their leagues is what makes them so charming. So unlike with Ragna, seeing our hosts relentlessly take the piss out of these two is hilarious! It helps that the jeering is relatively equal on both ends, which was an understandable turnoff for some back in Starscream's episode. And with how much these two get wrong, it makes even the most minute victories of theirs feel monumental, especially since they were saved for the end, a section normally allotted for a character's weaknesses. Some of Ben and Chad's best line reads of the season can be found in this episode. It's clear they had a lot of fun going off the beaten path. By the way, what's up with the pink key? Well, it was originally white, but then he accidentally washed it with colors. Jesus Christ. Setting this in a fighting tournament was a no-brainer. I can't believe this hasn't been done more often. But here, not only does it give them a natural reason to fight, it even allows Mr. Satan to show off one of his strongest and most important contributions to the Dragon Ball story, working the crowd. This allows him to show off and BS a ton, while also having to save face after getting intimidated by Dan of all people. A genius way of working his fear of Ki into the battle. What I'm about to say is meant to be taken in the most positive way possible. Zack's animation here is nothing short of pathetic. And that's why it's brilliant. Most of the hits are weak, these two barely show off any cool moves, we go for a solid 40 seconds of no background music, where this made Gara vs. Toph feel empty. Here it adds to the comedy of how little these two can do. Even when gifted with a jetpack, Dan can't help but flounder. And this jetpack leads to some incredible slapstick as the action goes from a zero to over the fucking moon in less than an instant. Nice use of those Craig McCracken style sound effects for the eventual fall, by the way. Gold. Nick Kramer, who's directed a number of episodes up to now, including this one, seriously, his snarky style of humor could not have been more fitting, voices the arena announcer. I would have said voice acting debut, but apparently he was also some of the civilians here. But this time, we get a full-on performance from the guy, and he's great at trying to keep the crowd hyped up through this obviously lame fight, which leads to a really funny moment of his showman persona slipping when even he can't salvage this shit show. What the heck? I mean, what a Yeah! Wait, what? Alejandro Saab is great as Mr. Satan, nailing that larger-than-life tone Chris Rager is known for with, well, all of his characters. I'm especially fond of his inner monologue moments for showing the cracks in his cons. Uh, what? <laughs> I've never seen these before! Obviously, my challenger snuck them into my row to get me disqualified. Y'all have found something fast. This guy's good. I can't track his movements. Watch closely. You're about to witness the real deal. But man, I've really got to hand it to Brad Venable as Dan. Back again as a complete opposite to the much more reserved Otacon. His voice is so shrill and whiny while still being enjoyable. And it makes his deliveries during the jetpack section even funnier for how unexpectedly pulled back his energy becomes. Time for the next evolution of my martial art, Ultimate Rocket Booster Psych Your Doom! Well, that's disappointing. Dynamite <laughs> King! <laughs> Behold the glory of Psych Your but man, oh man, that can't even compare to how unexpected the Satsui no Hado transformation was. His war cry is chilling. It looks like he's finally getting the break he's been desperately clawing at for so long, only to have it pulled right out from under him at the last second through his own incompetence. Classic Dan. I don't even care that this is technically a golden tree moment from the analysis, because if they had revealed the backpack, it would have ruined the surprise in the animation. This also ends up being the first completely unintentional kill of the show. 
which seems like it should be a cop-out, but isn't for several reasons. For one, there's no way these two would be skilled enough to kill a guy on purpose. Two, Mr. Satan was dominating Dan in the beatdown beforehand and was pretty much about to wrap things up anyway. He legitimately earned this victory, fluke capsule or no. Three, Mr. Satan wouldn't kill someone in front of his adoring fans? That'd be a PR nightmare. This was the most natural way they could have ushered death into the show without breaking the characters. Not to mention it's all beautifully tied together by the can-can music, the announcer's half-baked explanation, Mr. Satan just rolling with it, and Dan disappointing his father once again. Really, the only nitpicks I have are them talking about a ring out when there's no ring to be found, and Mr. Satan lamenting that he has only one capsule left. Are the rest of us not good enough for you, Daddy? Even though this was all about making fun of two joke characters, they still managed to sneak in nuggets of praise for them, especially Mr. Satan, who all Dragon Ball fans know is the GOAT. Coincidence? Dan is a joke among men, but Hercule is a joke among gods. Also, he has a better ending to his analysis than Wolverine and Raiden somehow. Have fun marinating on that. God, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> I need a team by that. I got this new anime plot. Yang Zhao Long vs. Tifa Lockhart It's been a while since we've had a more out there kind of representation as this is our first web series character to get on the show. Sure, Screw Attack was very close to Rooster Teeth even at the time, but I can appreciate this episode for acting as an important gateway to a trove of media that has gotten even more popular over the years. Which is about the nicest thing I could say about this episode. It's also the first one to use a series younger than Death Battle itself. I would say this affected Yang's analysis, but even Tifa's feels pretty barren barely even touching upon her trauma with Sephiroth and only mentioning her friendship with Cloud in passing. A pretty big thing to ignore. Which, now that I think about it, was probably to make both analyses feel even despite how much Tifa's content eclipsed Yang's at the time. But hey, at least we were able to bring Horny Boomstick back. It's like reuniting with your uncle at a family gathering who you haven't seen in years. But then you remember how weird they are and just want the party to end so he'll stop trying to get you to buy his World War II stamps. Mama, why do we have to keep putting up with that guy? Uh, anyway, I can at least give credit for them trying to be more creative with the horniness. It's just frustrating that we got a bunch of innuendos instead of a decent look at Tifa's story. And it's especially not the best look when Season 2, despite being 32 episodes, somehow has less than half of the female character count from Season 1, and that includes Returners. The last one we had was all the way back in Samus, the last new one we had was Toph, and the last female-led episode was Ivy vs. Orchid, which was two years ago by this point. But you know what's even sadder than that, I actually dislike this one even more than that episode. You know how every once in a while I'd complain about a 3D episode not having the best models or being a little hard on the eyes at times? Well, for the most part, those moments could be chalked up to technical limitations and didn't supersede my feelings towards the action. But this fight is straight up ugly. Yang's stylized model doesn't work in Torian's engine, Tifa has no facial expressions at all, and everyone either looks blurry, washed out, or both. The audio department is no better either. The sound design lacks that same punch from previous 3D fights, and is mostly drowned out by the two tracks, the former of which might be the worst song I've ever heard on the show. Sorry Anarchy Reigns fans, but this shit is nauseating. Ah, <sighs> God bless Season 3 for redeeming the OST's reputation. It's neat that this is the first episode to use one of the fighter's official voice actors, so of course Barbara Dunkelman feels natural in her role. Hello, no need to panic people, just looking for someone. I will take a strawberry sunrise though, no ice. Thanks. Nailed it. But I can't really say the same for Tia Ballard as Tifa, unfortunately. She is a phenomenal voice actress, don't get me wrong. But not only did her voice not really fit Tifa in my mind, her audio quality is surprisingly terrible. Only surpassed by Zack's voice actor. It sounds so warped and makes me just want to turn the volume down. Having fun? Hi, Sheriff. Don't mock me! I'm going to blow you out of the water! Not that I'd be missing much in the way of story. Yang acts like an asshole breaking into Tifa's bar for no given reason other than to beat her up, her hot-headedness barely plays a factor, and she mostly acts obnoxiously cocky, tanking a majority of Tifa's hits with relative ease. Like, I see no reason at all for her surviving this final heaven. The results certainly don't give one at least. Tifa's best lifting strength feats are exclusive to her limit breaks. Who cares? She still has the power to lift a fucking Lovecraftian nightmare thing that could summon a supernova. But no, 
Yang survived getting dragged through some stone pillars. GG's low diff. I'm not trying to say this episode is biased, but there were a lot of things that made it read that way. And I don't mean the verdict. Like playing Yang's theme song for the entire second half, not letting Yang get as frustrated as Tifa, including the Rooster Teeth logo, and the most subtle reference of all, you may have missed it, draping a literal advertisement for Ruby's upcoming third volume over the corpse of Yang's fresh kill. Like, wow, I know they were told to include some kind of promotion for the third volume, but surely they could have done something more tasteful. You can't even really call this episode all that thematic, especially since one of the listed connections comes from something that happened in Ruby after this episode came out. The main thing saving this episode is Torian's choreography. Even when the characters aren't as enjoyable, he still manages to include some great looking CQC and fun knots to their series. And the death is pretty cool. I wouldn't mind Yang getting a run back now that she actually has a decent amount of stuff to talk about, which let's be real is a whole other can of worms we don't have time to get into. And I especially want Tifa to get better justice done to her against someone new like Makoto. The poor lady can't even catch a break in the damn spin-off series. Until then, uh, at least we have the continuity gem scene. You know me, I just love to contribute to the cause whenever I can, especially when beautiful butt-kicking babes are involved. I never took you for a Tifa fan. And who wouldn't be? I've actually taken it upon myself to spread the good Tifa word any chance I get. And not just on death battle. Who do you think hacked that Italian Senate meeting? Wait a minute, that shit was you? Yep, pretty rebellious and cool, right? You drill bit, that was all my family could talk about last year. My own Nina had to go to the hospital from shock. Yeah, looking back, I probably could have picked some more uh, flattering imagery, but sometimes people only listen when you shout. And uh, make other sounds in this case. No, 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 stop, stop, next episode. Father, when can I leave? Don't you dare finish that sentence. Don't do it. I'm sick of it. Mega Man vs. Astro Boy Yes, I did watch the industry to see what the next episode would be. Though to be fair, I was already watching it because I wanted to see ScrewAttack do more original content. Guess how that worked out. As the first episode to premiere after ScrewAttack and Rooster Teeth officially partnered, it was nice to see things didn't change much in regards to how the show was handled. Both analyses give even amounts of respect to their stories and powers. That infamous aspect of Astro Boy's character was handled about as tactfully as it probably could have been. Though even as a kid, I never understood why they chose the end clip they did on Rockside. That's the equivalent of using the moon pissing bit for an Eggman analysis. It doesn't fit at all with the rest of the segment and low-key dampens its impact, but the fight is a fantastic first outing for Aquila. It's great to see some new blood for the sprite team, especially since Zack was bordering on becoming the next Torian with how much of the load he'd been burdening. And if I recall correctly, apparently a lot of this animation got corrupted, so she ended up redoing it all in the span of two days. Hot damn! Might explain why the opening has no sound design to speak of, but my god, this fight is just pure fun. Not only is it impressive how many weapons they were able to include for Rock, but they even went the extra mile of including all his corresponding colors too, which could not have been an easy process. This variety of weapons bounces off very well with Astro's more blunt style, leading to some awesome shots like Astro blitzing past Rock's weapons to tackle him, followed by said weapons to show just how blindingly fast he was going. Some of my favorite audio effects come from clashing metals. Normally, that would be in the form of a sword fight, but since these two are robots, we get those satisfying clangs the entire time. Enough to make up for the lack of voices. I love Rock's reaction to the butt gun, the sky fight is hype, and while it's another fuck off explosion, the fake out was effective. And the ending is even a little wholesome since it implies Astro is gonna help Rush with rebuilding Rock. Though it could also be him stealing Rock's dog. But let this be my headcanon. If I had one major issue, it would be the time stop sequence. As a kid, I thought it was so cool, and it still is. But then I learned the whole thing was ripped almost one for one from a Newgrounds animation. It's one thing to use moves inspired by the material a character comes from, hello Torian, but reusing fan content takes it to another level that rubs me the wrong way, frankly. But overall, this is still a solid episode showcasing two of the most iconic robots in fiction to see who will slag the other. Okay, technically that's not wrong, but it's still a fucking funny choice for a tagline. Green Arrow versus Hawkeye. This episode might be one of the biggest cases of, damn it, at least they tried. This was an obvious Marvel vs. DC episode for them to tackle that not even the preview from before tried to hide it. Another reason why the whole revealing only one character thing needed to perish. And these analyses aren't too shabby either with the history lessons and some really funny moments from Hawkeyes, especially the Nick cameo and the Ghostbusters kid. And this was Zack's last episode of the season, so of course it was gonna be well animated. Sadly, there's no real way to get around the fact that, at the end of the day, 
It's just two guys shooting arrows at each other for three minutes. Which is only slightly more interesting than it sounds here. To their credit, the show gets about as much mileage as it can out of these two by including a wide variety of arrows. But I think this would have benefited from having a better story to help flesh out the action. Cause these two don't have the same kinds of arsenals as Mega Man and Astro Boy to justify the minimal fight motivation. They make decent use of the recycled voice clips to the point where it almost sounds like they're interacting with each other. Again, not enough interesting action to suspend my disbelief in that regard like Ryu vs. Scorpion. Brownie points to Gumball, by the way, for my favorite comment I've run into so far on this retrospective journey. There's also just weird choreography bits that don't make any sense. Why did Clint decide to cross over to the other building, giving Oliver ample time to cut the rope? Or why did he decide to shoot his 30 megaton bomb arrow at Oliver nearly point blank? That's like something you would do. You know, I'm not even gonna pretend like I'm above pulling a move like that. I really am that petty. The close quarters is brutal enough, and the death gets the job done in showcasing the verdict. Even if they forgot to mention that Oliver learned how to teleport at some point. Also, Black Canary is there for some reason. And doesn't seem to be shaken up by this random guy she's very casually standing next to killing her husband. Did this Ganya put out a hit on Oliver? There's a reason these sorts of characters are saved mostly for support and aren't always front and center since it doesn't lend itself that well to a casual fight without an engaging enough story to keep things interesting. Even One Minute Melee had trouble saving this Baron matchup. And hey, Brandon Yates brings us another track. Though for some reason we don't get the lyrics version, and it doesn't really stick out as much as his others this season. While the attempt is commendable, this is sadly where the show's infamous comic book fatigue begins. At least in regards to Marvel vs. DC fights. We've certainly gotten a handful of really good ones, even masterpieces. But for the most part, they've never been able to hit quite the same and tend to blend in after a while. Well, maybe I need to introduce you to some of my trick arrows, like this bad boy here. You, you, you just put a boxing glove on an arrow? Yeah. Why? Well, so I can punch people from very far away. Well, I have other arrows. Searching far and wide, teach Pokemon to understand. The power that's inside. Pokemon vs. Digimon. Or Charizard vs. Agumon if you're one of those people. Okay, in case it somehow wasn't obvious, Pokemon was a massive part of my upbringing. So talking about this episode is probably gonna reopen some old wounds for patent reasons. So please, bear with me. First off, the title. I get why it's called that. It's basically the most concise way to sell itself to the audience. But man, when I was a kid who didn't know how budgets worked, I assumed at first we'd be getting an army battle infinitely more dense than Eggman vs. Wily. But even without that, I argue that the title still works for another reason that I'll get to later. I'm very happy with the way they handled Red. Taking that relatively recent miniseries and combining it with the first game was some clever stuff for getting as much as they could out of one of the silent protagonists of gaming. It's why I don't mind seeing Charizard back so soon, since this is a specific version of him this time. Anything that had already been mentioned before was concisely summarized, and there's more to go over like the unbreakable bond of friendship they share. Remember this. Even though I'm not nearly as familiar with Digimon, Ty has a great analysis, sans the way too long movie clip, tackling the Digivolution line and bizarre uniqueness of the Digimon story. But most of all, I like how they brought up Ty's character development, and how it strengthened his friendship with his own partner, and oh god, the flashbacks are here. I'd like to get the main negative out of the way. Even when sticking to the standards of the time, yeah, these 3DS graphics are still pretty rough. There do be a plentiful amount of glitching and clipping, and I hardly think that could be blamed on the digital world. But like most episodes of the past, this is forgivable. I even remember at the time leading up to the Death Battle Live show how Torian was scrambling to get the fight done mere hours beforehand, which you wouldn't be able to notice. Again, disregarding the obvious. It's the characters themselves that make this fight stand so tall, and it's why I don't mind the episode title. For it's not just a trainer battle between these dudes. Duos, it's a fundamental battle of how these two franchises work when it comes to escalation and stakes. With the former, we get that brilliantly with the back and forth transformation contest. I love how the fight doesn't begin until Ty wanders in, referencing how trainer battles start in Pokemon once you walk into a trainer's line of sight. It's the moment they've been standing around waiting for their whole lives. This is a big deal. And while this may not be normal for Ty, considering the shit he's seen, it's easy for him to just kinda accept. The first phase of the fight begins very pitifully, and the tone of the sound effects alongside Red and Charizard Art's confusion lets you know this was an intentional comedic note. In fact, pretty much all the jokes land. Even the Pokeball gag after Greymon comes into play. This is out of character since you can't catch other trainers' Pokemon in the games, but I still find this moment funny for undercutting the awesome sequence. What's more though is that this is the last joke we get in the fight. From here on out, it's massive projectile struggles mixed with exciting aerial combat. Just look at my fire boy go, managing to hold his own against a champion form. While it didn't last long, it's really cool how much his tricky movement combined with Red's strategy 
held out. But whoever said no to a little more firepower? The voice cast for this episode is flat out perfect. Xander Mobus is back once again to flaunt his range by voicing every form of Agamon that appears in the fight. The voices are seamless, and he pairs very nicely with Todd Habercorn as Ty. Ah, there's nothing better than a campfire and a golden, delicious marshmallow. Agumon! Okay, buddy, let's kick this up and out. Greymon! <laughs> let's try! But the sleeper hit this time was Nathan Sharp as Red. Why, yes, I do want to battle. How kind of you to notice. It's always a pleasant surprise seeing YouTubers transition into the acting world successfully. And even though Nathan is better known for his music, it even appears in a portion of this fight, and my god, does it still kick ass. He delivers an impressive emotional range that's especially important for later. You killed my marshmallow! Whoa! You can talk? You must be really rare! Get up, Charizard! No! Huh. I guess that's that. It's not over yet. I believe in Charizard! Whether it's his confidence in Charizard or horrified concern for his safety, the deep bond between these two is clear. Undeniable, in fact. Remember this. It makes both the Mega Evolution and the Warp Digivolution my favorite transformations of the season without question, and still some of the best today. The amount of impact these forms have just by their dominating presence and the chosen music to accompany them are perfect, especially uncontrollable for the climax. Oh god, here it comes. <gasps> the final bout goes down, and while it's clear Charizard is having trouble at first, it's his trust in Red's direction that allows them to turn the tides of battle. The strategizing here feels right at home in the anime and feels like it's coming from a seasoned veteran. He caught 151 Pokemon, you guys! That counts for... something. Holy crap, this franchise is massive. But then that second aspect of the battle I mentioned finally comes into play, the stakes. In Ty's world, there's no such thing as chivalry or rules in battle, so of course he'd take matters into his own hands. And of course, Red would be completely dumbfounded by this. I know I said there were no more jokes, but man, seeing Ty freaking deck Red despite being a total shrimp in comparison, and then holding his limp body afterwards is still so damn funny. Torian even wanted to incorporate some more martial arts, but then understandably decided that wouldn't make much sense. Even Charizard is confused by this. But now that Red is no longer able to provide him with a winning strategy, though let's be honest, that win was never coming in a million years, War Greymon comes in and oh, oh, oh. So fucking brutal. Especially when you know he's designed to kill dragons. Isn't he a flying type? Shut up, Game Freak! He's a dragon and you know it! An awesome, loyal dragon who still tries to get back up and fight for his trainer even after all the damage. And Red himself, even after getting his legs broken, called out to make sure Charizard was okay, prioritizing his Pokemon's well-being above his own. Oh god, it still hurts even after all this time! The Terra Force may have been over kill, but again, this was to show how fundamentally different Pokemon and Digimon are in scale. Essentially, Death Battle's way of shutting up the debate for good. For the most part. Not to mention seeing the two of them fade away together with that melancholy music served as the keys to making this one of the most emotionally charged endings this show has ever done, with only recent seasons coming even close to it. I swear, if they'd kept the original idea of Red hugging Charizard and saying I'm sorry, I would not be long for this world. My poor old heart. So much fun action between two different philosophies with an ending that sucker punches you in the gut. And then the verdict calls Pokemon slaves. You were doing so well! I get what they were going for when it came to explaining the different circumstances of their worlds, but to call it a master and slave dynamic after all that heartache and drama from before is quite frankly... Pokemon fans need to chill out over an eight-year-old episode, dog. Damn, it's really been eight years. Oh god, not another one. Who are you? Why, I am Steve. Raven. Cry Cajun? The troll in all of Raccoon Bros comments. Oh! Can I just say, as a fellow degenerate, I'm a big fan of your work? Wasn't expected to be complimented by a Canadian, but thanks. Anyway, move over, Nate. Those reviews had too much Pokemon bias. It's gross. Time for some Digimon bias to balance it out. And you can't refuse me, by the way. You know the rules. Stupid life clause contract. Plus, Raccoon Bro owes me a favor since the Milan incident. I should probably check to see if my cousins are okay. Anyway, on to being biased. This death battle episode means a lot to me. As a Digimon fan, it was awesome to see a series I love get represented, especially at a time where Digimon wasn't even airing. But the fact that it wasn't just a normal episode, it was the season finale, and it was against Pokemon. Man, it was pure bliss. 
I knew this episode was going to be good when I first saw it in my subscription box all the way back in 2015, eight years ago. Where did the time go? On to the episode. Charizard and Red are probably the most iconic trainer and Pokemon duo from the games, and Ty and Agumon were the most popular characters from the most popular era of the show. It just works. This also leads to some fun dynamics between the four characters, but I'll save that for the fight. 2D analysis! Yeah, I don't got much to say. I mainly watch Death Battle for the fights instead of the analysis, but I'll share some quick thoughts. I do find it funny that for Charizard, they just made it composite, including Ash's Charizard, Red's Charizard, Charizard from the games and the anime. <laughs> but for Aguba, they were just like, yeah, we are just taking adventures, Aguba. Bro, they had to make a composite so it's a closer fight. <laughs> if they made a composite Akuma, this dude is dead. Have you guys watched Tana Squad? Hell, Marcus from Digimon Tamers could probably solo Charizard. I did enjoy how the Pokemon analysis was more on the powers and abilities of Charizard, while the Digimon analysis touched more on the story of adventure. They even included the ending of O2 for Tai and Akumon's arc. You know, before Last Evolution did its thing and made fans confused on what's canon anymore. But somehow Sora still ends up with Matt. Yeah, I'm still bitter. Overall, the analysis serves its purpose and was enjoyable. Now on to the main menu, the fight. I ain't gonna go over the whole fight, so I'ma just go over the parts I like. One thing I will say before we start is to show some love to the voice actors. Nate wants to battle, does a great job as Red, and Xander Mobus kills it doing the Agumon line. And Ty, wait, it's been a minute since I've last seen this episode. Who voices Ty again? Hey, Agumon. Anyway, I do like how the fight starts with Red trying to commit comet theft. You disgraceful piece of shit. But Tai is an upstanding Japanese citizen. He will not stand for such evil. Seeing how both Red and Tai act with their partners is a nice touch. It really shows the differences of a Pokemon trainer and a Digimon tamer. Since Pokemon is more of a sport, Red calls plays like a coach and his player, Charizard, goes to execute following his coach's advice. I am recording all of this while bumping to Jelly Roll. While Ty rarely, if ever, tells Greymon or War Greymon what move to use, showing the complete trust he has in his friend. It really does show how different these two worlds are. And we also see this when Ty is willing to beat the shit out of Red for hurting War Greymon. Red ain't got no idea what he got himself in for. This Digimon baby, our protagonists have a history of throwing hands. Shout out TK Marcus. Obviously, another thing I like about this animation is, well, the animation. It's crisp, it plays off the abilities of the combatants very well. Shoutouts have to go to the Digi Evolutions. Oh my god, Torian, you're a madman. I miss you. And of course, it caps off with a great ending. Red and Charizard a bloody mess before finally burning them to ashes like they were a Leomon. Hey, you may not like it, but my childhood didn't die. Let's fucking go. In general, I liked this episode back in the day because Digimon won. Because back then, I actually cared about who won and who lost. Now, as an adult, where I don't really care that much, I look back and it's still a good episode. Obviously, being from season two, it shows its age, but there are still quality things about this episode. The fight and the music immediately come to mind. For a long time, this was my favorite finale, and that only got topped recently by two bald men. All in all, it's a great episode. I just wish that they could take what they did in this episode for Digimon and used it to make another good Digimon episode. I said good. I, I'm done. I'm gonna go eat some pizza while you and your jobber red enjoy the leftover crust. You crusty JPEG jobber. Hey, first off, PNG. Second, we Pokemon fans still have Lucario vs. Renamon. <laughs> Wait. And with that, I rest my case. I walked right into that one, didn't I? Yes. Yes, you did. Well, might as well cope with the simultaneous loss of my childhood and dignity by ranking and reviewing every episode in 10 words or less. Ready? Go! The day the Earth kept rotating like nothing happened. That tree is the only gold this episode's getting. Man, Star Wars really didn't have the best start, huh? Ah, 
So close to a number two joke there. Even the best bit from this episode is outdated. What do you want to do with your life? I want to rock! <laughs> Phew! All right, now to finally interrogate it, Tifa. <laughs> <laughs> Women sure do have boobs. That's why Bruce doesn't kill. He just sucks at it. I'm sorry, just... <clears throat> that fucking roof swing, man. Sucks to be the people in the road. And building. Are giant mech shows always this loud? Giant swords! Cling, clang, blam! Master Bison, he got souls bored. Nothing quite as relaxing as witnessing a furry hate crime. All that penis talk and not one expand dong joke? Be on the lookout for two stealthy ninjas tonight! What? Stop trying to ruin my childhood with math! Uh, right down Main Street? The best, most goofy way to follow up the rapture. Okay, now you're just showing off, Torian. Do it again! The best way to use nonfiction people? More fiction! Without a doubt, the worst tourist this city has had. Wow! It's just like the movies! Getting over here with Hanzo Asashi, featuring Ryu rage quitting. Tony is an alcoholic. D do I get paid now? How red turned into ash. Amogus. It's good to be a Satanist, I tell ya. I take it back. These are the city's worst tourists. Hey! Snake, that jump drive has the Discord messages. Hurry! Hey, so you're not gonna go nuts or anything because I put your episode at number three, right? Are you kidding me? Number three is bronze. That's still on the podium, you dingus. I still got it, baby! If I never see that guy again, it'll be too soon. Without a doubt, season two is a monumental step up compared to the first. Where that season was mostly about foundation and lives off nostalgia, number two builds upon it and provides way more episodes that hold up. More animators began to step up to the plate, bringing their own styles to keep the show from stagnating. Torian in particular brought a level of vision to the team that's unmatched. It's no wonder they wanted to snatch this guy up as a full-time employee, and not just a freelancer. While the research process was still metastasizing, the storytelling had gotten much more engaging. Analyses were simply better at familiarizing us with these characters and their worlds. Overall, at least. Ben and Chad feel far more comfortable in their roles, too, with Wiz and Boomstick slowly clawing their way out of their respective stereotypes as they become the hosts we know today. I love season two, but not as an actual season of a show. That's crazy to say, especially since so many hold season two in high regard. Some even still claim it as their favorite. After all, it had episodes like Snake vs. Sam, Iron Man vs. Lex Luthor, and yes, even Deadpool vs. Deathstroke. These are all monumental highs, no doubt. But these are just the highs, lest we forget the lows, or even the many, many middling bumps that constitute this scattered 32 episode long season. There was no way to predict whether we'd be getting a Wolverine vs. Raiden, or a Beast vs. Goliath with how all over the place it was. To be fair, half of the lineup managed an 8 or higher on my metric, and I don't doubt that the release when ready mentality helped give us massive projects that even managed to rival Goku vs. Superman on occasion in scope, the likes of which we may not see again with the more strict pipeline. But with a lack of structure also comes sudden changes to the lineup, budgets that creep well beyond the initial plan, and frequent hiatuses with no real warning. Even when the show started releasing episodes more consistently, we would still get those close shaves when it came to hitting said deadlines. And again, this all took place over a scattered 32 episode long season. That may not sound like the worst thing in the world, but you also have to take into account the two and a half year span this took place over. For all we knew, Season 2 was going to last forever, and I honestly thought it was going to when it didn't stop after episode 50, which is why making this review has been low-key a nightmare compared to the last one, even without the interruptions. LS Mark, how do you do it, you madman? Sure, season 1 was 25 episodes and lasted a little over 2 years, but not only were a majority of those episodes consistently shorter, not only do 7 less episodes make a big difference, just look at how long the last video was in comparison, the upload schedule only got more scattered once the show ventured into hiring a freelancer, which must have been an incredibly new and strange experience for everyone involved. There's no way it wasn't going to be scattered, and that was just one freelancer. Imagine what it was like at the time planning season two. But it's not just the schedule that was more consistent, but also the escalation. Take this moment and imagine if both seasons were a person, each trying to trace a straight line representing their overall quality. Season one wouldn't get it perfect, especially at the beginning, but it would at least 
make a valid attempt of getting from point A to point B as accurately as it could, and minus some pretty nasty offshoots in the middle, by the end, its improvement in resembling a straight line is remarkable. Season 2 would get it right much more often, but throughout various points in its progress, random earthquakes would occur that force its hand every which way. Looking at it as a big picture, Season 2 is undoubtedly a mess. An ambitious, beautiful mess that's so interesting to look at. And for all the times it missed the mark, it makes you appreciate those times where it does manage a perfect trace even more. Nowadays, we get lines that are a lot cleaner, being made in controlled, professional environments. I'm not saying we should try to trace a straight line in the middle of an earthquake ever again, but I can't help appreciating and respecting the strong resemblance to a straight line that season made all those years ago, amidst all the chaos. Arrivederci and stay tuned. What the fuck? <laughs> you again? I thought you were satisfied with how the review turned out. What more could you possibly? Wait, where are your legs? <laughs> when?